Welcome to a special edition of Global News Decision 2022. This is when you get to have your say about who should run Ontario's municipal government. Polling stations like this one will close in about half hour, uh, though there are a few places where voting places will be open as late as 10 p.m because of some technical issues. You know, local governments do not always get the heavy coverage you see for politics at the provincial or federal levels, but it is important to remember that what is decided at City Hall can directly affect your day-to-day -day life. Housing, transit, traffic, when your garbage gets picked up, all of that, of course, controlled locally. And tonight, you are electing mayors, councillors, regional chairs, and others who will soon be handed that power. We also have a team of reporters covering key races tonight. Matthew Bingley is at John Tory's headquarters. Karen Lieberman is covering one of his main rivals in the race for mayor, Gil Penalosa. Bernie Rosen is at Bonnie Crombie headquarters in Mississauga. And our Mark Carcassel will be reporting from the headquarters of incumbent Brampton mayor, Patrick Brown. Our Sean O'Shea is live in Hamilton. He is following former Ontario NDP leader Andrea Horvath's attempt to win the mayor's chair in the hammer. Our Queen's Park Bureau Chief Colin DeMello is standing by with his insights into the relationship between local officials and the province. Hello, Colin. And soon after the polls close at 8 p.m., we'll expect results to pretty quickly come in. You can follow the major races in your part of Ontario. Just go to our website, globalnews.ca. We also want to introduce our panel of experts that we will be drawing on all evening. We have Ed Keenan, columnist with the Toronto Star with a focus on people and politics in Toronto. We also have with us Olivia Chow, former NDP MP and former Toronto City Councillor, who also made a run for Toronto Mayor at one point as well. Thanks so much for joining us, Olivia and Ed, and we welcome you to our show. Well, thanks for having us. Uh, Ed, let's begin with you. What are you watching tonight? Well, well I... I'm watching to see one thing is the size of John Tory's margin. I mean, that may sound uh, anticlimactic, but, uh, you know, he, he's running for a third term. He's going to have a lot of authority. Uh, he won last time with 65% of the vote, so how much he wins. But there's uh, seven open council seats, a couple others where a company is running and looks like it might be really close. So I think the composition of the city council is going to be uh, equally interesting or, or more interesting than who wins the mayor's office in Toronto. Yeah, absolutely. And council will be looking quite different at the end of tonight because we know, Olivia, that there are eight open races in Toronto now as it stands. Uh, mayor John Tory, over his years as mayor, has had a pretty good handle working with the councillors as they stand now. How do you think he'll be able to work with a new council if there are eight new members? Well, it depends on who wins because Mr. Tory endorsed the whole slate of candidates, hoping that these candidates, if they win, will back him. Some of them are incumbents, others are newcomers. And then there's another group called Pogress Toronto that endorsed a different slate. They tend not to support Mr. Tory's um, policy. So it'll be interesting which slates win. And there will be a combination of it. So I'm going to start counting my fingers to see, is there a majority this way, that way? And because there's a mayor, strong mayor piece, uh, to veto the mayor needs two-third votes. So I'm going to count even more fingers to see whether it's more than 50% or maybe even two-thirds. <laughs> I, I think maybe it, it's already time to ask the question because we just watched what happened in Vancouver. They just had their municipal election. They have party system there. Does Toronto need a party system? Something that is, is, is more that voters would know, okay, I'm, I'm getting somebody who is either pro-Tory or is not pro-Tory or how they all fall we don't know, uh, but certainly Vancouver has it, uh, Would Montreal you has it. They're, well, with this new strong mayor thing, we need to watch. Like, I can't say for sure because um, Montreal also have a party system and had it for many, many years, so it's not new. Um, so I'm very skeptical about this strong mayor system mm. because it's taking democracy, the, the, the right of the local citizen to have a say because your councillor may not be able to control anything. Right. <laughs> Whether it's uh, development or the budget or um, 
your local, you know, how high is the building beside yeah, you? Yeah, let's get Ed to touch quickly on the strong mayor powers too, because we have heard John Tory come out and say he supports having that type of power. Uh, Ottawa has been very strongly opposed to it. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, I think the thing is, is that John Tory didn't need any strong mayor powers. In eight years, John Tory has not lost a single vote at city council on anything that mattered to him. Um, I, I think his ability to set the budget in advance without consulting with city staff. For, they, traditionally, the city staff sort of bring forward all these numbers, and the city council debates it in the round, the budget committee, and then the council. Uh, here, the mayor sort of gets to set a budget, and then there's an up and down vote at council and the budget committee. That's a big change, and also being able to directly appoint senior city staff is a big thing. But I, I'm not sure that these are powers John Tory needed, uh, and nothing he's promised makes me think that he's going to run into overwhelming opposition. So, uh, I mean, the way the, the strong mayor powers are phrased sort of at the discretion of the province, as long as it's a provincial priority, makes me wonder if this is maybe more of a, a strong premier system <laughs> uh, yeah. where, uh, where, you know, the mayor can override council if it's something Doug Ford really wants right. to happen. Yeah. Okay. Ed, Olivia, thank you so much for that insight. We'll be speaking with you, obviously, throughout the evening. Mm -hmm. But let's send things over to our Matthew Bingley, who is actually at John Tory's headquarters at the Fairmont Royal York tonight. Matt, what's happening down there? Well, Tracy, right now it's just sort of like the calm before the storm. Uh, only a few guests coming in here. I popped into the lobby a second ago. More people out there than there are in here. So obviously very early at the moment, so not much happening here. So let's just focus more on John Tory's campaign. And the one that he really ran uh, focused on maintaining a steady ship. Obviously, the city going through a lot of very turbulent times in the past uh, couple of years. And of course, we are, of course, uh, looking at how Tory is focused on how his approach to everything is uh, is really his message was that he is the one to manage that major issues like uh, expanding transit, making sure that no one comes in and really rocks the boat on that. Obviously, time and again, we've seen new mayors come in, tear up the plan, and of course, nothing gets done. Tory is saying that is not going to happen this time. That is, of course, one of the main reasons why he did run in the first place. But Tory this morning quite telling, saying that this is going to be his third and final term if he does win. Uh, but of course, the panel there just talking a lot about those strong mayor powers. Tory this morning again saying that he would only really use them if he needed to. One of the main uh, ways that he would actually focus on that would be the budget. Uh, obviously, he has maintained a very uh, steady increase on that, only seeing tax increases at or below the rate of inflation. Some people say that's a problem. This is the way that he actually says that it should be going forward. Not seeing a rapid uh, increase in anybody's uh, uh, fees, really. But it should also be pointed out that of the many people that Tory was focused on campaigning with, a lot of them are incumbents who uh, he would really see as a consensus side of that. So he doesn't have to use those uh, strong mayor powers after all, because, of course, the Tory that we have always seen is one who likes to build consensus. And of course, one final point, the campaign director who's actually just next to me here was saying that this is the time that they look at that is the worst as they wait for all those polls to close. So stay tuned, send it back to you. Thanks, Matt, I appreciate that. Uh, there are a number of challengers against uh, John Tory for the mayor's chair, but perhaps the most high profile is Gil Penalosa, uh, urbanist uh, who at the outset of the campaign didn't really have much in the way of name recognition. Let's go to the Penalosa headquarters and Karen Lieberman is standing by. Th does the Penalosa team feel like they've broken through at least on name recognition, Karen? I think that they're certainly hoping so. There's about a dozen of his volunteers that are here right now. It is actually a very upbeat party atmosphere. Although I will say that earlier this afternoon when we did get a hold of Gil Penalosa when he was out running, and, and we'll play a little clip for you in a bit, he did say to me that he was preparing his victory and concession speech. I was sort of surprised that he threw that out there. Uh, but he said that, look, at the end of the day, if it doesn't go the way he's hoping, his goal all along was to generate conversation about some of the issues 
some of the concepts that he says John Tory has been ignoring uh, for years during his terms as mayor. Gil Penalosa is, as you said, an urban planner. He has a lot of experience in that area. His focus uh, beyond affordable housing, which as we know is a huge priority for Torontonians, for him it's also about public spaces, green spaces. Uh, there was a concept that he threw out recently and actually backpedaled on, which was uh, turning into the island, air, turning the island airport into sort of a mini central park. And again, backpedaled on that and said, you know, he's up for uh, conversation about it. Now, we did talk to Mr. Penalosa this afternoon when he was out running in one of the wards. He's been running actually all of the wards for weeks. I am running in every ward between 8 and 14 kilometers. Today is my last one. It's 25th of 25 wards, and I have run about 265 kilometers. It's actually your first time running in a mayoral race, and so how, how are you feeling going into this election night? I'm feeling very good because I think that the city is falling apart. And when I run 265 kilometers of streets, I see parks, I see schools, I see libraries, I see neighborhoods, sidewalks, crosswalks. And I talk to people also. I have seen so many people hopeless, especially young people. Sure beats the five kilometer runs that I'm used to doing. Uh, having said that, Gil Penalosa also never been a politician before. This is his first time running. He says that means that he has no ties and no obligations except to the people of the city. All right, Karen, thank you so much for that. Uh, we will check back with Karen, of course, throughout the evening as well. Olivia, I want to talk to you a little bit about John Tory and running against him and what that's like. Uh, we saw John Tory and Gil Penalosa uh, participate in two debates together, um, only two. Uh, what is it like to debate with John Tory? Well, I think I might have done a hundred <laughs> <laughs> or thereabouts. <laughs> that campaign in 2014 was much longer. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm still waiting to see where that smart track landed. It's so maybe it was so smart that it hasn't, the track hasn't shown up yet. But um, uh, he uh, is like any other candidate, um, has a good campaign. Uh, he had the conservative and the liberal status quo type supporting him, uh, which makes it hard. And he also has uh, his Rolodex is full of people that have a lot of means, financial means, which means that he would be able to raise money quite quickly. Uh, that may be one of the reasons why it, you, do, you see that there's not a lot of candidates running against him. Because it cost, the, back in 2014, about $2 million to run a serious campaign. That's quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. uh, Gil Penalosa said that he entered the race because he didn't see anybody else taking on the progressive flag for this. That, it, Ed, I mean, nobody runs to lose, but if if the achievement here for him, for Penalosa, was to raise issues and get stuff on the radar that wouldn't be on the radar otherwise, did he succeed at that? I, I mean, I, th I think he did, to some extent, succeed at that. It is, it is an interesting thing where you see some analysts, I saw one quoted in the Toronto Star today, saying that, you know, for, for Gil Penalosa, the, the measure of success might be whether he gets through 25%, you know, exceeds what Jennifer Kiesmatt did. Um, which, you know, m most candidates want to measure success by whether they win or lose. Um, but I think he did, uh, because he emerged as sort of the main candidate, we have somebody at his office there tonight, um, he, he was able to talk about parkland and public spaces, which are his, his, the issues closest to his heart, and at, le and at least get them on the agenda. I mean, in the two debates we had, which were held in the middle of people's work days, uh, at like lunch hour, um, uh, John Tory kind of has a fog of managerial calm that he applies to any criticism that comes to him. But I think at the same time, people were still talking about a lot of the things that Gil Pennell also wanted them talking about. And so to some extent, that's probably a win. Okay. Well, as we know, you know, there are hundreds of municipal elections happening across the province, not just Toronto. So let's check in with our neighbors to the west. Our Brittany Rosen is live at Bonnie Crombie's headquarters in Mississauga for us. Uh, Brittany, we know that Bonnie Crombie is seeking a third term as mayor. What's the feeling like there tonight? 
Good evening, Tracy. Well, things are still quite quiet, but we're expecting it's going to be a different story when those results start to trickle in and when the doors open here at eight. We are at Metalworks just off of Mavis in Mississauga, and this is one of uh, Canada's top recording studios. It's also really a symbol of the significance that Mississauga places on the arts. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, what's expected for tonight is that the incumbent mayor, Bonnie Crombie, will uh, win re-election as in in her third term this is just because of how well she's done in the previous two elections you know sweeping those votes in 2014 by 63 percent in 2018 winning by an even larger margin so the incumbent mayor spent the day going out and doing one last day of campaigning she went to a local restaurant uh, Fred's Bar and Grill where she spoke to voters and encourage people to cast their ballots because voting rates have been a bit lower in Mississauga. So Crombie will be up against seven other candidates in tonight's race. Uh, these candidates aren't as ho high profile as some from the past, but they include Derek Ramixoon, David Shaw and George Tavares. These candidates range from, you know, lifelong residents, those involved with the community, entrepreneurs, uh, business owners, business analysts and filmmakers. Many have pledged to tackle everything from how housing and affordability, that's top of mind, uh, public transit as well as crime. Bonnie's campaign has really centered around bringing Mississauga more investment and making it even more of an economic engine. And one of the ways that she wants to do that is through what she calls Megxit, which would involve departing the city from Peel Region. Uh, Crombie claims that in in a decade that she could save $1 billion uh, if, if Mississauga were to do that. Uh, Here's more from Crombie as well as uh, her son, who uh, we had the chance to speak to as well. Yes, we're affectionately calling it Mexit. This is a campaign that Hazel McCallie and my predecessor undertook, and I hope to fulfill that legacy. It's time for Mississauga to control our own destiny and stand on our own two feet and be an independent, single-tier city, much the way that London and Windsor and Hamilton and even little Dryden are. So it's time for Mississauga. There's always a lot of anxiety on election night, but she was actually a city councillor right after she was in Parliament and then a mayor for two terms. But I'm really proud of her. She's done a lot for Mississauga. You know, she's a female leader, which is so important. So again, we are just waiting for things to get underway here at Metalworks. Uh, the doors are going to be open to the public, including who I assume will be lots of Bonnie Crombie, the incumbent mayor supporters uh, at 8 p.m. I'll send it back to you in studio. Uh, thanks so much, Brittany. L let me ask you a question, Tracy. If you were to say to our employer, you know, there's this other job that I would like a lot better. I'm going to go and look for that. I'm going to go <laughs> get that other job. And then you don't, not only do you not get that other job, but you get disqualified mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. applying for I that other job. Yeah. Uh, and then you <laughs> say uh, to your original employer, you know what? Turns out this is the job I wanted all along. I'd like to have this job back. Yeah. Who is? Patrick Brown. <laughs> <laughs> who is yep. Patrick Brown? Let's go to Brampton and Mark Carcasso, who is standing by at Patrick Brown headquarters. Alan, Tracy, it's certainly been uh, a campaign. It's certainly been a, a, a crazy year for Patrick Brown, uh, going for the federal leadership of the Conservative Party, coming back to lead the race to uh, be the mayor of Brampton for a second term. We're here with his campaign manager, John McEtitian. Uh, John, it, it has been uh, quite the mudslinging campaign, certainly on one side of it. And a lot of people have been speaking about uh, some of Patrick Brown's uh, aspirations, going for the federal leadership, getting disqualified from that race, coming back, running again in Brampton. How do you go about when you're running this campaign telling the people of Brampton you can still trust him, he still wants to lead this city, he's here for you? It's actually been one of the easiest campaigns I've ever been involved in. People of Brampton know who Patrick Brown is and they know his heart. And uh, one of the reasons he ran uh, originally for the Conservative leadership was Bill 21 when uh, something so wrong was silent on the federal level. No national politician stood up outside of Quebec and said this is wrong. And the people of Brampton understood that more than maybe any other community. So he represented them from day one going nationally, and I think they were happy to have him come back to Brampton 
and Brampton's lucky to have him. And it's, uh, you know, it, like you say, it's been a crazy year because I've been around for all of it. Yes. Uh, I'm going to be very happy to get a rest tomorrow. But but Patrick's going to win, and deservedly so. All right, that's John McIntyre, the campaign manager for Patrick Brown. We'll be checking in with him later on tonight and throughout the night here at Speranza Banquet Hall in Brampton. John, thank you very much. My pleasure. Back to you guys. All right, Mark Carcassel, thank you for that. Let's move on to another race that is being very closely watched tonight, mm -hmm. Alan, and that is in Hamilton, where former NDP uh, leader for Ontario, Andrea Horvath, is making her run at mayor. Now, she tried her hand at premier for four, four, four times. times. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and and didn't quite get there. Uh, she did, however, serve in municipal politics for three terms. So now she's she's going back to that level. And uh, we've got Sean O'Shea, who is live at Horvath headquarters tonight. Uh, Sean, tell us what's happening there now. I assume pretty quiet, but I'm sure she'll be throwing a big party there. Yeah, we're at a place called the Spice Factory on Houston Street in uh, Hamilton. And uh, yeah, they'll be pouring in a bit later. Just want to say about late, uh, results are going to come in later, probably not about until 9.20 because of a software glitch that's uh, plaguing the uh, city of Hamilton. So we won't be getting those off-the-hop results right after 8 o'clock, a bit delayed here. But, you know, Andrea Horvath, what a strong personal contender she's been. She's won 9 out of 10 electoral contests. The only time she's ever lost was in 1997 when she ran for federal office. She ran and won three times for local council, six times in provincial parliament. And, you know, today we watched that she was out uh, talking to people who met her on the street. She's such a well-known person in this community. She's a long, lifelong Hamiltonian, and, and people, you know, people like her. Uh, we were, you know, outside on the street when uh, we were interviewing her and somebody broke in, sort of a heckler who was disputing the whole idea that uh, there should be any socialist aspects in Canada. And she just smiled and sat and, you know, and watched and unfazed, unflappable. But that's what happens when you're a provincial leader for so long and when you're used to the cut and thrust of politics. Speaking of which, I asked uh, Andrea Horvath, well, if you become mayor, you'll have to deal with somebody named Doug Ford. Here's what she had to say when I asked her that question. If you win, one of the people you'll have to work with in some ways is Doug Ford. And what do you think of that? Well, I'm, uh, I'm heartened to hear that he's, uh, he's been very positive. He's, from the day I announced he was positive, said, you know, he knows I'm going to get up and fight for Hamiltonians every single day. Now, uh, win or lose, uh, Andrea Horvath says that uh, tonight is going to be a celebration for her because Andrea Horvath is having a birthday today. She's 60 years old today, so she says it's worth celebrating either way. Uh, polling locally here shows that she is ahead of the two main contenders. There's nine people in this race. Uh, she's ahead in terms of the polls, but as she said, and as all politicians say, the only poll that really matters is the one today. That is so true because anything can happen, and we're going to watch and see what happens here, albeit it's going to come in a bit later than in other parts of Ontario. Back to you. Okay, thank you so much, Sean. Now, the other opposition leader defeated in the June provincial election is also asking voters for a new job tonight. Former Ontario Liberal leader Stephen Del Duque is running for the mayor's job in Vaughan after a longtime mayor, mayor Maurizio Bavalosca, who there decided not to seek a fourth term. Another race that we're going to be keeping a very close eye on tonight. Mm -hmm. So let's bring in our Queen's Park Bureau Chief, Colin DeMello, who is standing by with us tonight. Colin, here we have two former Ontario party leaders now trying to be elected as mayor. If they are, in fact, elected and take on that role, they're going to have to be working with Doug Ford in a very different capacity. Well, How and the dynamic, the dynamic, uh, Tracy, between Doug Ford and Andrea Horvath, if she's successful, will be the most interesting dynamic. Those two have been at each other's throats since 2018. At one point, Premier Doug Ford even said in the legislature, quote, that listening to Andrea Horvath is like listening to nails on a chalkboard. He was never really apologetic for those remarks. But Andrea Horvath has said, you know, when she was there at Queen's Park, she was playing a role in the uh, official opposition leader uh, role. A and Doug Ford has acknowledged that as well. He said he'd be able to work with Andrea Horvath in her capacity as mayor because they know that they have to, you know, they would have a, a bit of a different relationship. Same with Stephen Del Duca, although, you know, Doug Ford hasn't really commented on Stephen Del Duca all too often. This is going to be very interesting going forward, though, because if these two get strong mayor 
mayor powers. And from what we're hearing, we could hear more about those strong mayor powers uh, in more detail, including which municipalities would be able to access those strong mayor powers and when. We could hear them as early as tomorrow when the Ontario legislature resumes. And that means that Andrea Horvath and Stephen Del Duca would be the beneficiaries of these new powers from their one-time opponent. So interesting dynamic there for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Colin. I appreciate that. Uh, and back to our panel, Olivia Chow and Ed Keenan. Um, give me a sense of, of, of that. I mean, you've played the role. You've been a politician. You, it, give me a sense of the partisanship, whether it's Andrew Horvath now in a new role against, possibly against Doug Ford as a mayor versus, you know, a, a premier. Well, I, you look at previous mayor, um, David Miller, and uh, his relationship with Delta McGuinty, for mm -hmm. example, was pretty courteous, and uh, they worked together on the uh, the LRT uh, plan. And uh, so it really, at the, well, the only difference is this: uh, back then, it, there wasn't a strong mayor system. Mm -hmm. With a strong mayor system, if it applies to Hamilton for example, and if Mr. Ford wants one thing and this strong mayor wants something else, then the clash could happen because um, Mr. Ford had uh, come in with ministerial permit to allow some development to happen without the local council saying yes or no to it. So I can see conflict around how uh, the green belt would be developed, for example, on how, uh, w whether development the developers get its way or whether it's going to be the local community getting its way. So it could clash. But at the end of the day, is how much money the province would really give to the cities because a large amount of money gets transferred from the province to the city. If they don't get along too much, the province could go, eh, and then the city would get <laughs> in serious trouble. Yeah. Uh, and let's talk about the, uh, about the city of Vaughan, uh, where sure, Stephen Del sure. Duca is. And, and you laugh. Why? Oh, no. no I just, <laughs> before we even get into the city of Vaughan, I just uh, yeah. noticed that with Stephen Del Duca, uh, Andrea Horvath, then include Patrick Brown and John Tory, we've got like this sort of uh, uh, provincial party leaders yeah. losers club uh, <laughs> all across the GTA. Uh, yeah. But it's also, you know, uh, a past... Doug Ford enemies list, mm -hmm. right? Uh, all of those people have, have gone head to head with right. Doug Ford in elections, including, including one that included yeah. Olivia at this table. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, and I mean, I think looking at John Tory, maybe more so than Patrick Brown, uh, you, you do see that Doug Ford meddles a lot in Toronto politics. But I, I also think that the John Tory will claim that he's gotten a lot of what he wanted, especially the province took over the transit plan. They're building the downtown relief line, which was a 35-year priority for the city of Toronto. So, you know, sometimes Doug Ford's attempts to prove that he uh, he can do better than these people he's defeated or been defeated by uh, could work in their favor if they figure out how to work the psychology right there. Yeah, there, there's always been that sort of joke that, you know, that, that Doug Ford ran and lost to be mayor, and now that he's premier, he wants to be mayor of Toronto and premier <laughs> yeah. as well. Do you, you get that, sense? No, no, I, I do, I do. And I, you were going to ask me specifically about Vaughn, but I think uh, <laughs> that, that Andrea Horvath and, and Stephen mm -hmm. uh, Del Duca, if they're paying attention, w they're going to have to play nice with both the federal government and the provincial government if they win. Right. Um, but I think there's a way of playing nice with Doug Ford that you can kind of almost dare him into... Uh, you know, Doug, Doug Ford is now suddenly the transit premier for Toronto, uh, which is not something that he was famous for when he was at City Hall. And it's, it's sort of, there are probably ways to, yeah. to get him on side. <laughs> I'm not an expert in that psychology. Yeah. Like and if Olivia's we remember the, the whole Scarborough subway, subway, mm -hmm. subway, which was his brother, right? Yeah. Um, Mr. Ford, right? Remember four years ago before, just before the election? Yeah. He squashed the 44 seats into yeah, 22. Yeah, he shrank the city He shrank it, yeah. And before him, Mr. Harris, uh, Mike Harris, remember mm -hmm. another conservative premier, um, got rid of 100 plus seats. So the mega city amalgamation mm -hmm. uh, got rid of 100 plus local councillor and then Mr. Ford then continued and got rid of another 22, which means that a little councillor, uh, um, 
in Toronto represents a huge number, over like 100, hundreds, people. hundreds. Yeah, yeah, yeah and just a reminder, of viewers, there. So, in the last election, there were 44 wards in Toronto. That's right. Now there are 25, uh, which means that a lot of councillors could not win win their seat. They were kind of kicked out of council. Mm -hmm. So this time around, we are seeing a lot of comeback attempts. What are some of the more interesting comeback <laughs> attempts? Uh, that I, you're keeping your eye I on don't that? know how. Interesting. I find any of them in particular, <laughs> but certainly uh, again in Ward, Ward One, Etobicoke North, uh, this is the first election in decades that there hasn't been a member of the Ford family running there. That was Rob Ford's city council seat. It was Doug Ford's city council seat. Yeah, then it was Rob Ford's again, and then it was Michael Ford's. Um, and so Vince Crisanti, who um, was not a very exciting city councillor when he was there, not particularly noticeable uh, for the city at large, but a, a sort of a right-wing councillor. He's, he's trying to make uh, a comeback there, and he's sort of facing Charles Azud, who's uh, a Progress Toronto, Olivia mentioned. We're just going to have to interrupt yep. you for just one second there, Ed. Thank you so much. We want you to all stay with us. Our coverage of the Ontario municipal election continues. This is a special edition of Global News Decision 2022. The polls have just closed in this year's municipal elections, though some voting places in various locations will remain open for another couple of hours due to some technical issues. So this is your chance to have input into how our cities, towns and counties will be run over the next four years. Well, one of the races, of course, we'll be watching very closely is who will be the next mayor of Toronto. The incumbent mayor, John Tory, seeking a third term. Matthew Bingley is at Tory headquarters at the Royal York tonight. Matt. Alan, of course, this will be the third and final term of Mayor John Tory if he is successful tonight. And that is exactly what Janessa Crognelli, uh, Director of Communications for the campaign, is exactly hoping for. And, you know, Janessa, one of the first questions I want to get at is just voter turnout. The advance vote was down. There is, of course, the idea of making sure that you get enough people out there. How did you try to make sure that you know, voter apathy didn't play into this. Yeah, for sure. So for us, it was really important to reach as many Torontonians as possible with that message that the mayor has for them, which is a strong vision for the future of the city. And so we had a really big push around advanced polls, trying to get people out for that. A same thing with mail-in ballot, making sure people had the information that they needed to vote. And then, you know, in the lead up to election this weekend, the mayor was out all day, every day, knocking on doors with candidates. That's in addition to the thousands of doors he's knocked on during this election, trying to get the word out and get people excited about the campaign and excited about uh, what he has to offer if re-elected. Now, when excitement is the theme, how do you really drum up that excitement when, when the message overall is stay the course and, and really slow and steady uh, and, and make sure that you're not rocking the boat too much? I think that for the mayor, you know, he's he's um, uh, led the city into achieving a lot of progress over the past eight years on things that Torontonians really care about, like transit, leading the city through the pandemic uh, into economic recovery, and now some of the new ideas he's putting on the table, like keeping that transit plan on track, uh, putting forward a five-point housing plan to get more homes built faster. And so these are things that Torontonians care about and that the mayor is really passionate about. And so we have found that those ideas have really been resonating with voters. Uh, if he's successful, he will be the first strong mayor. Uh, for someone who's built a reputation over consensus building, uh, it sounded this morning like Mayor Tory was saying that he would use these powers if necessary, but it sounds like by the way that he was campaigning, uh, 15 incumbents and uh, and newcomers that he has campaigned in, on behalf for, is, is that... Is there a reluctance going forward, do you think, of trying to avoid using these powers? Yeah, the mayor has always been clear when it comes to the strong mayor powers that it doesn't change his approach, approach to being mayor. His approach will always be to be collaborative and work with his city council colleagues to get the things done that he thinks are important for the city. Um, and you know, what you saw during the election was the mayor show support for, for candidates, both new and incumbent, that uh, indicated a willingness to work with him if re-elected. And um, you know, we'll see what we'll see what happens, but um, the mayor is going to work with whoever there, whoever's around the city council table to get those things done. And those strong mayor powers are there if needed. He's said very clearly that he's willing to use them to get important things done, like housing, like on transit but that's a more of a last resort for him. Okay, last resort, but of course we're hoping to see some new results in a short time, so we're going to throw it back to you at the studio. Okay, Matt, thank you for that. 
As you can see, party headquarters are certainly getting more and more full as the night goes on. Uh, we are going to send things over to our Karen Lieberman now, who is at the headquarters of the man widely seen as John Tory's uh, biggest opponent, Gil Penalosa. Karen, I understand you have his campaign director with you. I do. I have Jasmine Atfield with me, campaign director for Gil Penalosa, who, as we were just saying, has been a front runner in this race for mayor of Toronto. And so how are you feeling? Um, you know, we could be minutes away from knowing the results. Yeah, we've had 13 Canvas teams at the doors today, and the feedback that I've been getting has been extremely positive. So we're very hopeful. We know that this is a first time for Gil Penalosa, uh, first time in politics, and, you know, first time running for mayor, which is a huge job. If things don't go his way, you know, what do you see in his future? Is this, you know, will he pursue politics? Well, he's a visionary. He's been holding people's feet to the fire for Toronto uh, for years, and he will continue to do that uh, as a private citizen. I hope that he will run again. He is a fantastic candidate, uh, but I know that he will not let four years go by without making sure that we're making progress on the issues that are important to people. And some of the issues that we've heard a lot from Mr. Penalosa, uh, green spaces, public spaces. Uh, you know, there was one proposal that was not seen as hugely popular, which was changing Island Airport into kind of like a central park, a mini central park, um, in which case he backpedaled, said he'd be more open to consultation. Uh, do you think that that was problematic for him? I think the things that, the reasons that I were drawn to this campaign was because he has foresight. He's looking 10 years ahead. He has a vision. He's completely transparent about that vision. And he listens to people, right? And I really hope that the public saw all of those elements about him, that he is the quintessential city planner who has a vision and who has a plan. And I think people really respected that, especially when he showed that his openness to hearing people out. And we'll see if it translates into votes very soon. Thanks so much, Jasmine. Good luck to you. Uh, and we'll send it back to you and we'll find out more, I'm sure, very soon. Thanks very much, Karen. You know, I, I spoke with Gil Penelos uh, uh, last week, and actually, when, the day I interviewed him, I asked him about his whole, you know, park instead of an airport on the island, and mm -hmm. he said, I, I would prefer a park. And then the next day, the, his campaign put out a statement sort of kind of walking <laughs> that back a little bit and saying, well, I've heard you loud and clear, and, you know, it's something that we'll think about. Anyway, the, you know, the, the mayor of Toronto does not have the authority to decide because that, right. that's obviously a provincial and a federal uh, portion of land as well. But let, let's talk about the provincial angle here. We're going to talk a lot about strong mayor powers. Uh, and Colin DeMello, our Queen's Park Bureau Chief here, is with us. Give me a sense of what the thrust is behind the province bringing this legislation in. Well, this is the second election in a row that Premier Doug Ford has had direct influence over a municipal election campaign. And this one will really change how city politics works in Toronto, in Ottawa and other uh, cities for the next four years and for the foreseeable future. The big question here is really who is going to control that veto and what is that veto going to be used for? That is something that we don't know just yet. The veto is given to the mayors of uh, Toronto and Ottawa for now when it comes to provincial priorities. Who sets those provincial priorities? It's set by the provincial cabinet. It's set by Doug Ford himself. And we don't know exactly what those priorities are going to be except for the fact that it's going to be to build affordable housing. We're also waiting for a, a significant piece of legislation that will come tomorrow uh, that will deal with uh, zoning laws in the city of Toronto and all cities as an example. The province could be giving itself the power to override some municipal zoning laws. So again, we're seeing a a lot of influence from the provincial government. Municipalities are a creature of the province of Ontario, of course, but here we're seeing an outsized influence all to build affordable housing. So the question going forward is, who is really going to be mayor here in Toronto? Is it going to be John Tory or is it going to be uh, Doug Ford? In Ottawa, as an example, they set out right, the mayoral candidates, they are not going to be using these powers because they felt like they were undemocratic. In Toronto, we just heard some of uh, John Tory's campaign uh, spokespeople say he will use it as a last resort. So that will be the backdrop and the most interesting use of those powers going forward because it's really largely undetermined right now. Yeah, absolutely. And let's talk a little bit more about those strong mayor powers and what they might mean in Toronto uh, with you, Ed. Um, John Tory, as we know him, how often could you see him 
using those powers, and that would also depend on the makeup of council. It, it will depend on the makeup of council, and I, I but I, but as I said, you know, I think John Tory is somebody who hasn't had any trouble winning votes before, and I don't think he would have to use the veto. I think the elements of the strong mayor powers that involve him being able to select senior staff and set budgets in ways that mayors haven't been able to before, you'll see him using those to a, to a large extent, uh, and I think that'll make a big influence. But then I think also we have, as Colin mentioned, sort of the strong premier factor here, which is that Doug Ford, uh, before the last election, before this election, and now we're expecting sort of within this next week to implement new powers for the province that's going to over, overrule zoning, municipal zoning laws and whatnot. I mean, I, I think we'll continue to see the premier assert himself as the real opposition <laughs> at City Hall's uh, and, and see how mayors... I, I don't think any strong mayor powers Doug Ford gave them is going to allow them to overrule that. Mm -hmm. uh, Olivia, I think part of what Doug Ford has done in terms of you know, slashing the size of council and then this is, is sort of his belief that, especially Toronto City Council, uh, that it is dysfunctional, that it doesn't get anything done. That has, we've heard that from the Premier. You served on Toronto City Council when it was larger. I mean, what's your assessment of it? Does, is is the council, the municipal council, broken in terms of getting things done, like building affordable housing, getting transit done? Absolutely not. It's not broken. Uh, but people keep trying to break it, uh, from amalgamation to uh, cutting half your councillors out. Um, what is the core problem? is that it doesn't have taxing power beyond the property tax, which is very, very small. So the economy could grow, but the tax base don't grow. The income could grow, and the money for uh, city government won't grow. When you deal with something like uh, public health and housing, and, and building affordable housing costs money. Let's be serious about what affordable means. Our premier said affordable. What he means is like $2,000 uh, a month for a one bedroom. That's not really affordable. Affordable is a third of your income would go to pay rent. That's truly affordable. To build that kind of housing costs money. The city have never had that kind of money. And so it's really up to the provincial and the federal government coming together. Same thing with TDC. It costs a lot of money to run it. And you need to subsidize it because we have a big city and there are places where the density is really low. So you have to subsidize the buses that runs in those area, right? So um, the system is not broken. The financing of the city of Toronto services is broken. It needs to be fixed. And everybody's been trying to fix it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you, you say that council isn't broken, but it is a common complaint that things take a very long time. And this happens when there are too many cooks in the kitchen, say. Uh, so yeah. when it comes to uh, the number of council seats, um, is this the, the right number? I, I think we were closer to the right number last time, and I think maybe it's a matter of the right number for the right thing. I mean, the thing I would say, though, is that there is this perception the city council couldn't get anything done. But David Miller never lost a vote at city council. He got everything done he wanted to get done. Mm -hmm. John Tory has never right. lost a vote. Right. There were four years where council was undoing everything Rob Ford's predecessor <laughs> implemented. That's Rob Ford's main project. And then his own city council was undoing everything he did. And then, that, then you saw the infighting. But that was a really dysfunctional term of council, mm -hmm. largely because of leadership. But I think the, the, the problem with, Toronto, with, with a fewer number of councillors in Toronto right now is that the number of the people that they have to represent, but not just that, that... Our city council also acts as like the, the troubleshooting customer service line, right? If you want your uh, permit for your renovations on your house approved, or if you want uh, a speed bump in front of your house, you have to call and negotiate with your city councilor and get them to take up your cause and advocate it. In some cases, if you want a special occasion liquor license, liquor license permit, you have to have your city councilor sign off on it. And when you've got uh, someone like uh, outgoing councilor Joe Cressy representing 115,000 people, um, and, and dealing all of those speed bump complaints. Uh, maybe we need, if we're only going to have 25 councillors, we probably need something else that deals with those neighborhood level issues. Because I think maybe on the big questions of like what transit we build, we, we need a smaller cabinet or an a, a executive committee. But maybe on the customer service issues, we actually need a lot more at the ground level. We had that 
is called <laughs> city council, right? <laughs> and then we had metro council, which is all the regional, like police yeah. and TTC and all those big regional. And then got the, the local council got eliminated. So and just to follow you know, up on a point, uh, Ed, that, mm -hmm. that you made, um, and this was a scorecard that was kept by the City Hall watcher. Tory was on the winning side of 97.99% of significant votes during the, the last four years, uh, the last four, 2018 mm. to 2022 council terms. So that's, uh, that's very interesting to note. Uh, before we go further on this, we do want to send things over to our Amar Khan, who is live uh, in Scarborough Center in Michael Thompson's ward. Now, this is a very interesting race tonight to watch, um, namely because the incumbent councillor and former deputy mayor, uh, Michael Thompson, was charged with two counts of uh, sexual assault uh, in the last few weeks. He has asserted his innocence, um, and Amar, he has served in municipal politics for a very long time. What's going on there tonight? Yeah, Tracy, there's a certain mood that's going on here where there's a lot of excitement. There's there's people that believe Michael Thompson, that say that they know him. They've known him for a very long time. And there's a lot of longtime supporters here. We've got a couple dozen folks here. It's not a massive party here at the Wendy's in Scarborough, but Michael Thompson has been in this role for s several decades now. Uh, going back to 2003, just in the last election, he had a 69 percent vote share. So he's really well liked by the people here. And as you mentioned, just a couple weeks ago, October 4th, the charges broke. He was, he's been charged with two counts of sexual assault. Uh, those charges obviously have not been proven in court. But the OPP, the Ontario Provincial Police, laid them after investigating, uh, you know, what happened. And it goes back to um, uh, July 3rd and 4th uh, when uh, the councillor and former deputy mayor was in uh, Muskoka so that he's talked about it very briefly saying that he wants people to focus on the issues he, and uh, what's happening in front of the courts should stay in front of the courts even now we've talked to some people uh, who are connected to his campaign and they've just said we want to talk about the issues. We want to talk about the campaign. But obviously, it's, it's impossible to miss that there is this massive dark uh, cloud that's that's hanging over uh, this campaign. Uh, but you know, Michael Thompson is a favorite. He's really well liked here. Um, so it's it's hard to see uh, you know um, things changing here. But uh, we'll, we'll we'll await the results here shortly, Tracy. Okay. Thanks for that, Amar. You know, and, and interesting there, you know, uh, Michael Thompson has been in council since 2013, and mm -hmm. as Mar talked about, you know, that there's not really a strong challenger in that ward, mm -hmm. so it's not like if voters were like, well, I don't care for this, and like, where are they going to put their votes? It's, it's challenging yeah. for voters in that region. Let's take you to Mississauga, I'll go back to Mississauga. Brittany Rosen is standing by at Bonnie Crombie headquarters for us. Britt. Good evening, Alan. Yeah, that's right. We're just here at Metalworks. Uh, the doors have officially opened up for uh, the incumbent mayor, Bonnie Crombie. And joining me now is her campaign co-chair, John uh, Capobianco. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, uh, it's been, you've been with Bonnie since the beginning, since 2014, uh, when she ended up taking over for uh, her predecessor, Hazel McCallion. How has the, uh, how has the campaign been? this election compared to the previous one? Well, there were big shoes to fill, of course, having to replace uh, Hazel McCallion. But I think what you've seen over, over the last eight years with Bonnie is a strong, steady leadership. She's taken the city, which is already a big city, into a bigger city and allowed for more innovation, more jobs, high-paying jobs, more housing, and the transit that's going on now over the course of the last little while. So it really has reflected well on the city, and not only just within the region of Peel, but broader than that, including the, the GTA and even bigger than that. So it's been a really good run for, for Bonnie, and, uh, and hopefully she will, uh, she'll get re-elected tonight. Absolutely. You know, there is no guarantees as to what's going to happen, but I took a quick check at the, some of the polling is starting to come in. She is up by uh, roughly uh, about 4,000 votes. Uh, how are you feeling about tonight? Well, we're feeling good. The campaign manager and Darren and, and his team have done a phenomenal job and, and really have just worked hard. We didn't take anything for granted. We knew it was going to be a hard election campaign, uh, as all of them are, but we worked hard and Bonnie worked to every house and she went to every event she possibly could. 
and really tried to connect as much as she can with the people of Mississauga, much like she's done over the last eight years. She certainly did this in the last uh, last few months of the campaign. Definitely, and things have evolved so much, you know, ever since she got into office, you know, we've gone through a pandemic. Uh, we are going through high interest rates and affordability is top of mind. In your opinion, what are voters heading to the polls with or headed to the polls with keeping in mind the most this election? Well, I think like a lot of Canadians, the cost of living and the rising cost of food and gas uh, and quite frankly, even housing. So I think a lot of those issues, Bonnie has been trying to uh, work within the city, within her council, to try to make sure that people of Mississauga do get affordable housing, do get transit, are able to, to get jobs um, and, and pay for some of that. And I think she's also working not only with her colleagues in Peel, but across the province, including the provincial government, to try to get those issues resolved for a lot of uh, Mississauga residents, but also beyond that. John Capobianca, Bonnie Crombie's co-chair, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So again, those results are still uh, trickling in, and uh, we could see some uh, more votes start to come in any moment now. But for now, we'll send things back to the studio. Okay, thank you so much, Britt. Let's bring in Colin DeMello now to talk a little bit more about Mississauga. Um, and Colin, we have heard Bonnie Crombie campaign on wanting to remove Mississauga from Peel Region. This is Mexit, as she calls it. Uh, what do you make of that? And will it be good for Mississauga and will it be good for Peel Region? Well, the argument there is that Mississauga spends a lot of money subsidizing the other two cities, Brampton and Caledon. And, uh, you know, Bonnie Crombie has made this argument that Mississauga should be its own standalone city. In order to do that, though, she needs Doug Ford's approval. She needs to go to the province, and the province needs to really, um, you know, bless that separation. Right now, they share a lot of things, including uh, police, paramedics, roads, uh, traffic lights, etc. There are a lot of shared costs. Let me tell you, though, uh, Hazel McCallion, the former mayor of Mississauga, has pushed for this for years. She is somewhat of an unofficial advisor to Doug Ford. The two still meet up for breakfast from time to time at an Etobicoke breakfast joint. If uh, she hasn't been able to successfully lobby Doug Ford to change this, I don't know if necessarily uh, Bonnie Crombie will be. The big, uh, you know, thing that holds them back is the fact that what happens with Caledon, it would really start to lose a lot of that tax base from Peel Region. So Doug Ford has said no to Hazel McCallion in the past. It'll be interesting to see if a strong mayor, Bonnie Crombie, if she gets those powers, will be able to convince Doug Ford otherwise. Thanks, Colin. Let's uh, check our results because we do have some results coming in right now. Uh, we have some polls reporting. Unsure exactly how many polls have reported at this point, but uh, Bonnie Crombie out to a, a commanding lead. This is not really a surprise. This should be a fairly easy re-election night for Bonnie Crombie in Mississauga. And let's take a look at the city of Toronto now and the mayoral race there. With 73% of the polls reporting, John Tory, again, a very comfortable, let's say, lead 61% there. Gil Penalosa at 18% at the moment. Yeah, and the question, as we've talked about, is can he beat Jennifer Keys? Matt's mm -hmm. number from the last time I was a 22, I 20. I think it was around 21. I, we'll check that. And we'll It'd be interesting to see guys. whether or not he gets past that uh, mm -hmm. uh, that mark. Let's go back to Hamilton and Sean O'Shea, who is following the results coming in uh, for Andrea Horvath and her attempt to become the mayor of Hamilton. Alan, uh, still waiting. It'll be probably something like another hour before those results uh, come in. Uh, the spice factory is starting to fill up with people. It's 7 50 a drink. We're not partaking, but that's the job here. I will bring in Carla Weber Gallagher. She's the campaign manager uh, for Andrea Horvath. Uh, Carla, what kind of a campaign has this been like from a closest perspective at the door fronts on the street? I mean, this has been a great campaign. Andrea has such depth in Hamilton, and certainly we've seen identifying supporters and, and getting them out to the polls that that really holds strong throughout the city. Um, certainly we're excited about the results tonight. And, and how is this different? You were with her at Queen's Park. How is it different on a door-to-door -door campaign here in Hamilton when she's running for herself as opposed to running for herself and also having to run for a political party? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a lot more personal, a lot more, you know, she knows the people here, the people here know her. Uh, and that's a really, like, warm uh, relationship that she has with Hamiltonians, and it's, it's great to see. We wrote for a bit with her today, and she got that, except for one little interaction with somebody who had some other issues. But she handles those kinds of things with a certain amount of aplomb, because she's been through that before, right? How is it different to have a political 
person like her trying to get elected to a mayor plea job versus somebody that's a first timer? I think, you know, her experience shows. Andrea is, uh, she has been doing this for a long time. She does it extremely competently and extremely well. And I think that that will be a huge asset to City Hall here for her successful this evening. Carl, thanks very much for the time. Thank you. Okay, so she's going back to deal with other media people and the party is going on here. I mentioned earlier that it's not only um, Election Day, but it's also Andrew Horvath's 60th birthday today. Hey, maybe we're going to see a cake with 60 candles. Can't say that for sure, but as Andrea Horvath told me today, uh, no matter what happens today, uh, there will be a party of celebration because it's a big celebration day for her. She is the front runner, although polls only mean so much. The real poll is what happens today at the ballot box. There has been a very strong uh, advance poll here in Hamilton, which the campaign told me earlier that they were uh, quite enthusiastic about. We'll see whether that translates into big numbers uh, for Andrea Horvath. She, you know, has nine out of ten when it comes to political successes. The only time she's not won was 1997, 25 years ago. She ran as a federal member of parliament, lost to a guy named Stan Keyes, a local television reporter. But after that, nine out of ten, nine straight wins on a personal level. So she's a force here in Hamilton. Will she become mayor tonight? We're going to let you know a bit later, guys. Back to you. All right. Well, either way, Sean, please wish her a happy birthday from our entire team here at Global News. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Sean. So, Olivia, you know Andrea well. Um, let's talk about how she would be a, a different politician serving in municipal politics as mayor as she has been in the Ontario NDP leader role. Well, remember, she was a city councillor before she ran provincially. Um, so... That's good because she knows the local issues. About the difference is that you can get things done quite quickly locally. So it's instant gratification. It's not always pitch battle. It's not about getting the media attention only. Uh, it's about bringing people together. And that's one thing that she is good at, bringing people together to move things forward and I think that's a, a good recipe for success um, but in provincial you tend to just you know <laughs> it, there's a lot of theater and drama and show um, it local... is not at City Hall and drama? <laughs> Come on, there's just as much there as anywhere isn't there? Well, except that if you want a local park you can get a local park right you can but there's actually... all the drama and the uh, tearing of the well, hair and the renting we, of the clothing we, and yeah all. well I, I think uh, none of those people that used to tear off their clothing are still there <laughs> <laughs> one of their sons is running though. that's yeah. true yeah. Mr. Mr. Mamaliti Mamaliti. Like yeah. Yeah. Running, so. we all have good memories on that one <laughs> All right. Uh, now, in the last few minutes as well, we did see um, some results coming in for the Toronto mayoral race. Uh, and that was for, for John Tory, who currently sits at uh, 61%. Um, and we were just talking about Gil Penalosa and whether he was reaching Jennifer Keesmatt's mm. number. That, by the way, was at 23.5%. Um, in your opinion, would you say that this was a pretty impressive run then for Gil Penalosa, having come from really having no name recognition at all to now? So, so, so far, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll see. But, yeah, I mean, it, it puts him in a league with Jane Pitfield, I guess, and to, uh, head of to where Tooker Gomberg was against Mel Lastman back in 2000. Uh, but, um, but, I, I mean, I, I think... You'd have to ask Kim Penalosa if it feels like it was successful. But some, somebody who I think, with these early numbers that we've got, can feel good about where she's running, uh, even if she would like to win, uh, is Chloe Brown, who's at 7%. But I think started this uh, race with very close to zero name recognition across the city uh, and has run an impressive campaign, participated in the debates. Was, was, I thought she won the first debate in terms of being the most forceful person on stage and challenging Tory. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, she's at 7%, which is not going to... There's no path to victory from there, mm -hmm. but and I, I think uh, to she, she's cut in here yeah. because we are declaring uh, we have a decision now that John Tory has been elected the new or the same Toronto mayor. So he is now going to be serving a third term as mayor in Toronto. Uh, let's uh, go to Matt Bingley, who is at John Tory headquarters with reaction to that. Matt. 
Well, Alan, a big cheer as uh, it, it was declared for John Tory within the room. Uh, obviously, a lot of people coming out to support him this time around, a lot of his key supporters. Uh, just a reminder that Tory had campaigned on this staying the course, uh, a, a real theme of that. But it is also important to point out that just from some of the early numbers that we're seeing, it appears that the vote is weighed down. There were questions among some if just getting out the number of people to vote would be enough. But there's a major, major margin over uh, Gil Penalosa, who did uh, show himself to be one of the, uh, uh, the key contenders to come up against Tory. But just compare some of these numbers to last time, uh, you know, it, it really is remarkable to think about the size of the city and how many people are available to vote. So I, I'm actually just going to crunch some of the numbers here and then I'll, uh, I'll, if you could come back to me in a bit, but I'll just send it back to you for now. But it is uh, obviously a lot of people excited here for uh, another four years of John Tory. Uh, really managing over transit, uh, housing, and a number of other key things that uh, that have obviously connected to the majority of people who did show up to vote. I'll send it back to you for now. Okay, Matt, we will let you crunch those numbers. Thank you. Okay, so let's head over to Gil Penalosa's headquarters now then. And, uh, you know, as Ed just brought up, it, it is a very important factor whether Gil feels like tonight was a win. Um, I mean, it's no surprise that Tory won, but having come from, you know, a, a first-time politician, as a first-time politician, um, gaining as much name recognition as he has, Karen, how are things over there at Penalosa headquarters? Yeah, so Penalosa Camp obviously uh, disappointed. Uh, you know, the, everybody here was hopeful, was hoping that uh, Gil would come out as the next mayor of Toronto. That obviously always is the goal when you set out on such a ambitious campaign. These are a couple of volunteers who are with me right now, Elizabeth and Malcolm. Malcolm, you had a huge role to play. And so I, I guess, how are you feeling tonight? I'm feeling a little disappointed. I feel like I'm a little disappointed that Toronto is not willing to dream a bit bigger. You know, I feel like John Tory to me represents the status quo perfectly. He upholds the status quo perfectly. And the status quo, frankly, is not working for a lot of people. Uh, be that on housing, you know, for people who don't own houses, might want to someday, uh, are, are unable to live in the city because of the custom cost of housing, or be that on transportation, just getting people around the city in a way that works, uh, whether that's in, in cars or, or, or other ways. Uh, I think John Tory, John Tory is embracing a status quo that it just, just isn't working. That's and Elizabeth, something we heard a lot from Gil Penalosa throughout uh, the last couple of weeks is the need for city parks, more public spaces. I, what, what about his message resonated with you? Definitely the parks part of it. I think the green spaces in Toronto currently are amazing and I would like to see them expanded and protected. Also affordability, um, better bike transportation. As it is right now, you can get to some parts of the city via bike, but the the routes are a little bit divided, and I think adding more coherence to that would be fantastic, which is what Gil represented to me. Thank you both so much, and I'm sorry it didn't go your way, but obviously, as we know uh, and we've heard tonight, Gil Penalosa is a man of big ideas, um, a visionary, and so uh, we will find out in a couple minutes when he takes the stage and gives a speech what his plans are for the future, and, and will he run again, and you know what's what's in the works for him. Back to you guys. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate that. Uh, and from the city of Toronto, let's take you to the city of Mississauga. Bonnie Crombie has been re-elected. She also now will see, serve a third term as mayor, just like John Tory winning a third term in the city of Toronto. Bonnie Crombie winning a third term in the city of Mississauga. That's right. Our Brittany Rosen is standing by at Bonnie Crombie's headquarters in Mississauga. Brittany, what's the feeling like there in the room? Yeah, it's starting to fill up, Tracy. The energy is starting to get high. You can hear the music that is going on, and that's because it appears, as you said, it uh, it is another victory for Mayor Bonnie Crombie. This it will be her third term as mayor. You know, she, she started in 2014. In uh, 2018, she's won by a large margin. And looking at the results right now, 66% uh, of the polls have been reported, and uh, she has more than 50,000 of the vote. So take a look at the room here. Um, it is starting to fill up. You know, 
we expected this just given how she's done in the previous two elections. Her campaign has really been centered on housing, affordability, public transit, and Mexit, which we were talking about, which is Mississauga departing from Peel. She says, you know, her goal is to continue to make Mississauga an economic engine, continuing to attract uh, investment into the city. And those are really going to be her goals as she goes into a third term as mayor. She's had a pretty successful political career, starting off as, you know, an MP in 2008, a liberal MP going into munici municipal politics. And again, just uh, a huge victory for her to Tonight. We expect her to uh, make her victory speech soon, uh, and uh, and uh, she's actually, it appears she's uh, going to go on stage soon. I'll, I'll send it back to you in studio. What? Uh, Lots okay. of moving pieces. Yeah, right. thanks, Brittany, what as uh, as people starting to head in. And of course, we, we knew this was going to happen pretty quickly tonight just because yeah. of the way we have the electronic voting these days. If you did go vote today, thank you very much for doing that. But you saw you just fed your, you know, your paper into the machine and then just press mm -hmm. a button and it comes back pretty quickly. We are experiencing some delayed results in some areas, though. For example, in Hamilton, we know that those results are going to come back in later. There have been a number of other areas where there are individual voting areas that are open 10 or 15 or 20 minutes later. Right. And it does appear we are getting some more results, though, from uh, Scarborough Center. If we can pull up that board there. Uh, Michael Thompson has been reelected as city councillor in Scarborough Center. And remember, we spoke about this uh, just just a few minutes ago that that uh, that ward seeing controversy given that Michael Thompson was charged with sexual assaults just just weeks ago and kind of the final weeks of this Ed, campaign. Yeah. yeah. Ed, Ed Keenan, does this just prove that name recognition is everything in municipal politics? It doesn't matter what they say about you or what you've done. Well, and the Your name is out there. The incumbency advantage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the thing is, is that p part of this would be that nobody high profile was running against Michael Thompson. There was no big campaign with fundraising dollars behind it and community support. And so when he's charged with two counts of sexual assault, we don't have any information about that. We don't have any way to judge those charges. He's not explaining anything other than to say he's going to fight them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and so there's, there's nothing voters can do with that. But also, you know, we saw a list of candidates there, but none of them were really well known in the community. And so voters are left with almost nothing. Yeah, and you mm -hmm. raised that important point is, you know, Michael Thompson over his years has always been very outspoken on social media, speaking to reporters. Uh, and since the charges uh, came out, silence. Maybe he's, you know, tweeted out three times, four times. Um, Olivia, do you think that this helped him or hurt him? It didn't matter, um, unfortunately. I think it should. But uh, as Ed has said, it's, when you're high profile, name recognition, remember, representing over 100,000 people, first timer is going to be really hard. And there's no party politics involved. So it, it's hard to get your name out there uh, unless you are a media personality like you, if you decide to jump in, then it's a bit easier because... Alan, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and earlier, we were talking about party politics as it applies to the mayor, and I think it may even have a bigger influence if we were to introduce it in these city council races, where you would have, at least if there's, a, there's no other candidate you recognize, they might represent a party you'd want to support, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or uh, it doesn't have to be a political party. In Vancouver and Montreal, both big cities, they have uh, a forward or ABC or any number of visions, different yeah, city specific yeah. city specific parties that may make sense, then makes it a bit easier perhaps. Mm -hmm. But for Thompson here, as he winds his way through this, the system and through the criminal system, I mean, he can continue to serve Absolutely. until what? What would remove him? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. If he's locked if in jail, jail. Uh, you're not okay. actually allowed to serve as a city councilor while you are an inmate in a prison. But, but as far as that, I know, a criminal conviction doesn't uh, doesn't disqualify you. So unless right. he's sentenced to a to, to go to jail, he can right. continue to serve. Okay. That's right. And we, we just want to cut in, conviction. actually, because uh, we're hearing that Gil Penalosa is speaking at the podium uh, right now. We are going to listen in. Listening, learning, and sharing. 
It's a grassroots campaign. We, our donations, our budget was one-tenth John Tories. Our campaign was the budget, the donations were one-half what Jen Kismer got last time. So I walked the city, and one of the things, I walked many times, every ward, walking and cycling and talking to people. One thing that I heard is that the city wasn't good for everyone. People said, oh, Toronto's good, but for others, sorry. <laughs> uh, they said, Toronto's good, but for others. I talk to the young people, they say it's good, but for the boomers. I talk to the boomers, they say it's good for the young people. I talk to the people in the downtown, they say it's good for the suburbs. In the suburbs, they say it's good for the downtown. I mean, everybody thinks it's good, but for someone else. So John Tory has the opportunity in the next four years to make it good for everyone. Too many people are leaving Toronto because they cannot afford to live here. Teachers, nurses, artists, Chefs, everybody's living in Toronto. We need to be able to retain our people. We need to be able to attract people. Sometimes I'm called a dreamer. And I don't like it because sometimes they say a dreamer with a despective way. But the reality is that I'm a dreamer because if I don't dream the impossible, we cannot really face do the possible. And everything that I, it's on my policy, everything is doable. And it's doable with the existing budget. If Toronto keeps the property taxes middle, not the lowest, not the highest in the middle, everything is doable, everything. And by the way, all my ideas are available to Mayor Tory. And my ideas are available to mayors and councils anywhere. As an example. <laughs> As an example, if cities in the GTA, if the other municipalities, if they adopt my idea to densify the transit corridors, we will be able to house all of the additional population, 100% of the additional population in the existing footprint, and we don't have to use one single square meter of agricultural land. We have to stop the sprawl and not do the Highway 413. That is Gil Penalosa uh, speaking at his headquarters tonight uh, after losing to uh, John Tory. He talked about how, uh, how much less in terms of donations and resources they had than the Tory campaign, yeah. saying that his ideas are still available for John Tory should he be interested. Uh, we have more results coming in, and this time from Brampton. They are going to be flying in at this point of the night. Okay, here we go. In Brampton, Patrick Brown has been re-elected there with 61% of the vote. Nikki Kaur, who was seen as his biggest opponent, has just 25% of the vote there. Now, this is not the final result by any means. There are 68% of the polls reporting at this point. Mark Carcassol is at Brown headquarters uh, with reaction. Mark. <laughs> Yeah, Alan, uh, supporters of Patrick Brown here at the Speranza Banquet Hall in Brampton just finished a chant of four more years. So while it has not been officially declared yet that Patrick Brown is getting a second term as mayor of Brampton, the people here seem pretty convinced that he is. And those numbers do seem pretty convincing. They seem to sync up with the polling numbers that were seen leading up to this. Uh, the latest polls show that Brown had uh, about half of the vote at the time, with Nikki Kaur somewhere around 12. Uh, and a certain segment still undecided. It appears that those undecided votes have been split between the two because, as you mentioned, we're seeing Patrick Brown with more than 60% of the vote. Uh, certainly a lot of support here. It's something that we've spoken about earlier that while there's been a lot of controversy in this campaign surrounding Patrick Brown, some people feeling he didn't really care about Brampton by running for the federal conservative leadership. Some accusations of him hiring friends and people connected with him to do the work to try to get a university campus here to Brampton. An investigation that he and supporters on council later killed. Investigations 
uh, pertaining to his chief administrative officer and uh, improper hiring practices. There's been all kinds of controversy. And those who follow the politics here in Brampton closely at City Hall seem to care very much about that. But in talking to people on the streets here at Brampton over the last couple weeks, it seemed like the average person is very happy with the job that Patrick Brown did, very happy to have him back for a second term as mayor. And we're seeing today he's essentially bound to be reelected. All right, thank you so much for that, Mark. That is our Mark Harkisol at Patrick Brown's headquarters. And I'm sure those speeches will all be happening shortly as well. Uh, we want to send things over to Amar Khan, who is uh, at Michael Thompson's uh, ward, Scarborough Center. So there, Michael Thompson has been re-elected as councillor. He was also formerly deputy mayor, so it'll be interesting to see what happens there if he'll uh, mm -hmm. kind of take on that position again. Uh, but Amar, um, I'm interested to know how the feeling is there because it should be a celebration and I'm sure it is of sorts, but there is also obviously this, this undercurrent there and, and the charges of sexual assault that are kind of pending and on everyone's minds. Uh, what's the feeling there tonight? Tracy, it's been one of cheers recently. Uh, we've seen him be declared and there was loud cheers multiple times. There was people dancing and enjoying themselves thinking that this was a bit of a foregone conclu conclusion that he would win that he has the support and he hasn't really lost it and that's kind of what we've been hearing from a lot of people here is that yes there there is a little bit of concern but they keep telling me one thing we know him we know him he's been in our lives for 12 13 14 years right he's been in this seat for 19 years so there's a lot of trust in michael thompson and what they keep telling me is we'll let the court we'll let the courts handle it we'll let the courts handle it and that's been the same thing from the Thompson campaign who have said, hey, when he comes in here, we don't know if we're going to even speak to you guys. And if we do, you better watch the questions, right? So there is a real there is a real concern about some of these questions, these concerns regarding the sexual assaults that happened in July, these alleged sexual assaults that are before the courts uh, in Muskoka. So, Tracy, it's, it, there is a little bit of a, there's joy, but there's trepidation also in this room. Okay, thank you so much for that, Amar. Uh, let's talk more with our panel uh, tonight about uh, what we're seeing happening here. I mean, these aren't any big surprises in terms of these mayor's races. Uh, is this the power of incumbency, Olivia? Absolutely, absolutely. So tonight to watch, I think it looks like all the mayors have got re-elected. Um, the interesting one is in Ottawa, and I think the um, um, Mark Sutcliffe won, mm -hmm. uh, both of them are newcomers. But in terms of uh, the local race, it looks like the people that John Tory has been uh, putting in a last minute robocall or His going to yeah. endorsement, it didn't seem to have made a difference. I think Alejandro Bravo seems to be winning. It looks like uh, Mr. Crawford may go down. I don't know that one. Amber Molly in Lickshore, which is, uh, I suppose, running against Mark Grimes. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Tory put in a robocall last minute, and Amber Molly may end up winning. So there are places where, uh, oh, uh, in my own neighborhood, uh, Diane Sachs was supported by the mayor, but it, the um, Norm de Pasquale uh, might have won. So still early, but it looks like the last minute phone call did not amount as much this time as in last time. Because three mm -hmm. seats switched last minute mm -hmm. um, by a very narrow margin four years ago when the mayor uh, put in his, his phone calls. Let's talk about uh, a ward in Scarborough, right next to the one actually that Amar was at. Um, and that would be Scarborough North, mm. where there's you know an interesting kind of turn of events and a very tragic turn of events that has happened in the last few days. Uh, the incumbent councillor there, Cynthia Lai, passed away suddenly, tragically, um, on Friday. And this was just days before. Um, and uh, tonight, you know, those votes for her, and she was very popular in that, mm -hmm. in that ward, those votes for her will not be counted. That's right, and uh, I, I don't think we've seen the results mm -hmm. back from that, but I think it really uh, th throws it into a chaotic situation there because a lot of voters had already voted in advance voting. Uh, she was expected to win by a, f a fairly, sub very substantial margin. Uh, her name's still on the ballot, so at ballot polling stations today, people were being told she died, she's ineligible, mm -hmm. but her name's still on there. Um, and so... What it becomes is, is sort of that whoever wins from among the rest of them on there 
uh, is going to win that race. But so th this is a case where there's that was a, a John Tory endorsed candidate running against one of the Progress Toronto endorsed candidates. But but there was no other candidate who might represent what Cynthia Lai represented. Like that part of the political spectrum is now unrepresented. And second place, it's it's sort of we'll see if it winds up being uh, Jamal Myers, who was you know sort of running second in the polls we saw, but or or if somebody else surges up. But it, it really is a uh, uh, you know it's it's a counterpoint to sort of the Michael Thompson situation where voters might not know what to do with that. Here's a situation where an incumbent who seemed to be cruising to re-election died, and there's no way for anybody to pick up their torch and carry it in the election. It's it's sort of the also rans. One of them is going to wind up with it. And I think the the language that the city has said is that they're they're actually not going to count those votes. Mm -hmm. So we may not actually know how many votes <laughs> Cynthia. Yeah, I think in, in the legislation, what it says is that any votes cast for her will be disqualified. That's right. Um, and so, so I, I think we may not even see what that total vote was. I'm oh. not sure how they're reporting them. I haven't seen the raw numbers yet. Uh, we might not know how many votes she got that were disqualified. Well, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And just on that front, what kind of message do you think that that sends to to voters, the ones who? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it's a, uh, it's it's strange that the law is written that way. And I think uh, it, you know, within a certain period, uh, perhaps a by election or a provision for allowing another candidate in would make more sense. Might be something that we want to revisit now that we've seen yeah. seen it in action. I don't, I can't remember another case of that happening in the in the time I've been following municipal politics. So. I want to bring you up to date on a couple of results that we have coming in. We've been talking about some of these uh, ridings, these wards in Toronto that have no incumbents, so they're fairly wide open. This is Spadina Fort York. This is formerly Joe Cressy's uh, ward, and it looks like Osma Malik, the former school board trustee, is out in front here, out in front of April Engelberg, that is in Spadina Fort York. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, was one of eight open races where there were no uh, there was no incumbent running. We want to send this back, send things back to uh, Matthew Bingley. Well, I think we have oh, a couple oh, more here. We have, here. We more have more uh, Toronto Centre. Right. This is Chris <laughs> Moyes. Uh, this is this is pretty much we expected yep. this. Uh, Chris Moyes uh, uh, working uh, long and hard with uh, Chris Long Tam, expected to win here. And I think we have one more of our open uh, wards as well. Oh, and then okay. a University of Rosedale, Norm Deepakasquale, who is very, Close. very narrowly out in front of Diane Sachs, who mm -hmm. uh, the former environmental commissioner uh, for the province of Ontario uh, ran for the Greens in the last provincial election and right now is narrowly in second place trying to claim a council seat. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we are going to send things over to our Matthew Bingley who is at John Davis <coughs> headquarters. Uh, Matt, I imagine a pretty celebratory tone there. We have now heard Gil Penalosa speak at the podium. Are we expecting John Tory anytime soon? Yeah, Tracy, we're actually hearing that we'll see him uh, closer to 9 o'clock now. He is, of course, uh, upstairs uh, here in the hotel uh, waiting with uh, some of his supporters and family. Uh, one of those supporters is uh, joining me now. This is Bob Richardson, uh, former chair of the 2014 uh, campaign. Uh, you know, you were just up there a moment ago. Uh, I I'm just wondering what the mood is like in that room. Mood is very good. People are feeling good. Uh, Mayor did really well tonight right across the city. Strong support both in the suburbs and downtown. So he's got a really strong mandate to get things done. And I got to tell you, he's uh, keen to get back to work. He'll be in his office at 6.30 tomorrow morning. You know, you, you talk about that strong mandate. Uh, 2014 was obviously a time where we saw voter turnout much, much higher than we are seeing uh, this time. Uh, and in fact, the vote, I, I know we have about 160 polls to go here, but uh, the vote for Tory uh, down by about 150,000, uh, 53,000 rather at this point. You know, it seems that some people didn't come out, and where do you think that disconnect is with a number of the voters in not coming out? I think there wasn't a particularly strong challenge. As a result of that, the numbers tend to go down. And if you take a look, I think about 80% of incumbents got reelected and didn't really have strong races either. So uh, I'm not surprised at the numbers that we're seeing. Uh, that being said, of the people that did come out and vote, he has a very strong mandate, and it's citywide.
Citywide, but you know, one thing that will always be brought up against him, uh, you, you know, despite the fact that we are going to be seeing uh, a number of issues that he says that he was going to hold the line on, uh, there will require some consensus building. I know he has the strong mayor powers or will have the strong mayor powers as he goes forward. Where do you see the first spot that he really needs to start fixing? Uh, you know, a number of those issues, uh, the cracks beneath the surface were things that he himself conceded to. Where do you think, you know, job number one is? Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, number one, he's got to build a consensus among his council so he can move forward. That's something that he'll be focused on. There are a number of new councillors, so he'll need to get to know them and work with them. He did a very good job of that last term. Most of his votes were pretty overwhelming, so I think he'll be trying to do with that. There's a lot of small things in this city that we've got to do a better job on to get right, and I think you'll see the mayor moving quickly to try to get a lot of that done. You know, the previous mayor, uh, Rob Ford, was really good at focusing on those small things. Uh, is that something that, that Mayor Tory needs to look at a little bit closer now? I think what happened during the pandemic, there was a move, moving around of a lot of staff, and I think some things didn't get done as quickly as they could have been. That's over and done with. Time to get back to work and time to make sure that those uh, things get repaired and uh, everything is back and in good order. You know, uh, just one one more question for you here. The difference between 2014 and now, obviously we've gone through a life-changing thing that hopefully none of us ever have to see again. But w aside from that, where do you see the biggest, I, I guess, tonal shift when it comes to the campaign versus this one? Uh, well, I think one of the things we, we've seen is that the mayor's done a good job building consensus. Again, strong support across the city, but he's also worked well with the pr a province and the feds in order to get money to get things done. Now, uh, now the three levels of government have got to work hard to deliver on it. Well, and that is, of course, uh, something that Mayor John Tory has prided himself in, and we're going to hear more about that going forward. I'll send it back to you at the desk, but first, uh, uh, just a reminder, we should hear from Mayor Tory around 9 o'clock. I'll send it back to you for now. That number? Okay, thank you so much for that, Matt. Uh, we want to show you some live pictures now coming in from Michael Thompson's party headquarters tonight. He has been re-elected as a city councillor in Scarborough Centre. He is the incumbent, uh, incumbent and former deputy mayor, but he did step down from that deputy mayor role uh, in, in October following the charges of two counts of sexual assault that he is now facing. Now, he has asserted his innocence through his lawyer. He hasn't spoken much about the, the incident at all, the alleged incident. Uh, and uh, he has, you know, been re-elected largely. This, these are the, the people of Scarborough uh, Centre saying that they've known him for a very long time. He has served in municipal politics for almost three decades. He's been a city councillor since 2003. So as he is facing these criminal charges, you know, people there seem to still have faith in him, or at least they are putting their faith in that, that uh, name recognition. So he appears to be stepping up to the podium right now, and let's listen into his speech here. All right, so there is uh, Michael Thompson there. He has just been re-elected. Big smiles from him. Remember, we haven't heard much uh, from him in the last few weeks after these allegations of sexual assault. But tonight he is going to be making a victory speech, speaking to the constituents, I'm sure, and thanking them all for their continued support throughout all of this. Uh, let's listen in. He's going to be making his speech any moment now.
probably are adjusting that microphone. Colin DeMello is going to join us. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about let's talk about name recognition, right? Yeah. Michael Thompson, under some you know difficult circumstances, runs for re-election, gets voted in with a very healthy majority. If you take a look at name recognition, though, there are some other candidates who do have a lot of name recognition that are currently struggling right now. Mm -hmm. One of them is Stephen Del Duca, who you know ran as the leader of the Ontario Liberals in the most recent election, lost uh, to uh, uh, Premier Doug Ford and decided yeah. to run for the mayor of Vaughan. Exactly. We are going to get to Stephen Del Duca in just a little bit, Colin. Let's listen in to Michael Thompson. <laughs> wow. Wow, wow, wow. It is so great to see everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. This is truly amazing. This is a great night. I'm delighted to be here in this amazing facility here at uh, Wendy's Restaurant. You know, this is uh, an amazing victory tonight. It is one that has been a rather difficult election for us here. We're not used to these types of difficult elections and so on, but I know that it has been very difficult for my family, it's been difficult for me. And all I can say is I want to thank my family members who are here this evening. Thank you so much for your loyalty, your dedication, and certainly your contribution to me, and of course to our com uh, campaign, and of course our community. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm so delighted to be here. I'm overwhelmed because of the support and the, um, you know, the effort. I don't even know what the numbers are. I'm told that I won, but I don't know by what. I don't know of anything. It's just a very moment. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, first and foremost, though, I want to thank uh, Ethan Williams. Isn't he outstanding? <laughs> wow. He's eight years old, as he's indicated that he is uh, one of my youngest volunteers, and I want to thank him. He has just been absolutely amazing. Thank him for this fine introduction and so on. I want to thank, first and foremost, the people of Scarborough Centre. You have been my rock. We have worked together for many, many years, 19 and counting. I want to thank you, the ones who voted for me, and I also want to thank the ones who didn't vote for me, because it's really important for you to understand that you, by taking part in this election, you have played an essential role in democracy, and democracy is something that I strongly believe in, and it's really something that's important. We should never take it for granted. I have always worked hard for this community, and I want to continue to work hard as uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the things that are important here in this community. I want to make sure that our community is safe. I want to make sure that we have prosperity, we have a healthy community, and I want to make sure that we are strong and we are resilient and we are prepared, certainly for all the things to come as we make great strides and effort with respect to making certainly this community better and this great city. Volunteers, thank you so much. Woo! Big round of applause for all of you guys. You have been absolutely amazing. But I want to again just acknowledge certainly my family and uh, they have been there for me. They have been my rock and they have in fact been uh, you know, valuable to the support that I've um, garnered and, and have received through this election. They have been there in all the good times and they've been there in the challenging times and so on. So this is by all measure uh, your strength and uh, your uh, confidence in me as family and we have uh, worked hard together. So I strongly thank you for your um, your, your guidance and your support through the challenging times. I want to also just thank my amazing... All right, so that is Michael Thompson re-elected as Councillor of Scarborough Center, making his victory speech tonight. Now, without directly speaking to and addressing the charges of sexual assault that he is facing right now, he did speak about the recent difficult and challenging times. He thanked his family for their support, as well as the constituents for their support. Uh, you know, he also thanked the ones who voted for him and the ones who didn't vote for him because in taking part in the election, 
people have taken part in democracy. So here is Michael Thompson, who has been a city councilor for 19 years. He will continue to be city councilor for another four. Uh, and we know that he was also formerly deputy mayor, but uh, he had to step down because of those charges. So it'll be interesting to see whether that will be you know, reinstated or what will come of these charges. His next court date, by the way, is in November. Uh, let's bring in Colin DeMello now, our Queens Park Bureau Chief. Uh, so we just saw Michael Thompson there. Despite the controversy and the you know, scandal that he is facing right now, name recognition has gone a long way for him. There are other people, as you were just speaking about before Michael Thompson was making his speech there, other people who have name recognition that are, that are feeling a little challenged tonight. Yeah, Stephen Del Duca being one of them. Chief among them is Stephen Del Duca. I mean, you know, we were talking uh, earlier, Ed Keenan was mentioning all of the, you know, former leaders from John Tory to Patrick Brown uh, to Andrea Horvath and Stephen Del Duca running. And Stephen Del Duca, you can see here, He's got that name recognition, obviously, because he ran a provincial election in which his name was pumped out right across the province, certainly concentrated in Vaughan. He lost his riding uh, in the election in Vaughan. And here it looks like, I mean, there are still a lot of polls that still have to come in. You can see at the top right corner of your screen, yep. just 21% of the polls reporting. So there is a long way to go. But as of right now, he is losing by a slim margin uh, to his competitor, Sarah, uh, Sandra Young Rocco. Yeah. So this could be you know, potentially an upset of a night for Stephen Del Duca, uh, so close to losing the provincial leadership and the provincial election campaign. Uh, Del Duca led the Liberals to, you know, the second worst result for the Ontario Liberals with just eight seats, losing, of course, to uh, Premier Doug Ford. So it will be interesting to see what comes of him there. The other, um, uh, you know, m m uh, provincial leader who is also running, Andrea Horvath, we're still waiting for those results to come in. They were a bit delayed uh, in Hamilton, but we'll see how she does uh, in the time to come. But the other four we were talking about, John Tory, former leader of the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party, he's won. Um, Patrick Brown, former leader of the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party, he's won re-election. We're waiting for Andrea Horvath's results and Stephen Del Duca to see how those formers, if they will be, you know, new leaders on a municipal front. Trace. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Colin. And we just want to bring our panel in on all of this action that we have been <laughs> seeing in the last few minutes. Quite a bit there to take in. Uh, but Stephen Del Duca first and foremost and as Colin had just mentioned you know he didn't have a he doesn't have a great track record when it comes to winning um, and, and tonight we are seeing although it's only 21 percent of the polls reporting we know that some polls in in the Vaughan area um, are open until 10 so we may be seeing some of those results come in a little later um, what's up with Stephen Del Duca well I mean <laughs> 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 Seems like maybe he's not as popular as he'd like to be. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think <laughs> that's that's it. As Colin said, he, he he lost his own seat in the provincial election, right? And that's um, that that's not a ringing endorsement of how popular he even is close to home. Um, so it's still, uh, you know, we don't even have half the results in Vaughan in yet. It, it looks like he could still come out and be the the mayor of victorious, but but it also looks like there's a chance he can lose. And I, I think. Maybe he'd have to, if he still feels called to service uh, a after this, it might, it might be looking at other ways to serve rather than putting yourself forward as the, okay. the because it, it, it does, <laughs> doesn't seem like a ringing endorsement of his leadership so far, the recent electoral history. But he, he, he could turn that around, you know, just in the next few hours. He yeah. could, he could, yeah, certainly. But, I mean, with someone who is as widely recognized as he is and someone who has the endorsement of the outgoing mayor in that, in that city. Yeah, we, we have talked a lot tonight about name recognition uh, and how important it is, how powerful it is in these races. Uh, he certainly has that. Uh, and so something else is a factor here. Well, when we start uh, looking at city council, Olivia, uh, we're starting to look at, starting to see what's going to, how it's all going to shake down. Um, what are you seeing in terms of what the new makeup of the council is? I know we don't have all of our results in yet. And how does that, like, how much does that matter now that John Tory has more powers and, you know, a smaller council and ability to say, no, this doesn't align with provincial priorities, so we're not doing it? Yeah. I think it's sending a fairly clear message. There are three incumbents, councillor, that are struggling. Mm -hmm. One probably have lost. Mark Grimes has been there for quite a long time, Tropical Lakeshore, and uh, he has one. Okay. No, no, and, no I, I just uh, I was yeah. going to say that. And and, and there are um, Mr. Crawford was uh, the budget Scarborough chief Southwest, at yeah. Scarborough Southwest. He's struggling. Right. And uh, also Francis Nunciata 
high profile, high profile deputy speaker, etc., deputy mayor, speaker, um, struggling. And what the message is that don't take voters for granted. Mm -hmm. You've been there for quite a while. I think the voters are saying that we don't like the way the city is functioning right now. The water fountain is not working. The washroom is not <laughs> open. You know, the roads are, you know, construction all the time and the housing is not affordable and et cetera, et cetera. TDC is expensive. So all of that, I think, it's a bit of a message being sent to some of the incumbents. We actually have some results in some of these open wards where there is no incumbent. Mm. Uh, for example, here is Davenport, Alejandro wow, Bravo. Wow, 71 percent. Uh, is 71 percent. John Tory had endorsed Grant Gonzalez. I, I, I'm going to get you guys to, to weigh in all of these when we get through all of them. I want you to take a look at these next numbers that we have coming in. And then you give me a sense of what this means for John Tory and for the uh, Council as a whole here is in Willowdale. Uh, Marcus O'Brien Fair, uh, also endorsed by Tory, losing to Lily Chang here. Uh, in Etobicoke North. Yeah, and in, in Etobicoke North, this was, uh, as we had mentioned before, there had been a Ford running here for some 22 years. Uh, and this is the first election where there is not in, in that long. So Vincent Crisanti, a comeback story for him, former city councillor who lost his seat to Michael Ford uh, and now has been elected as city councillor there. 41% of the vote with 93 polls, 93% of the polls reporting. And in Don Valley East, we have John Burnside, who again lost his seat as city councillor uh, back in 2018 when city council was shrunk uh, to 25 seats. And here we have him back in city council tonight in the open race of Don Valley East. So now Burnside is a Tory endorsement. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's yes. what I was just yes. going to say. Yes. He was. But, but those, I think out of three, three out of four there, uh, that had Tory endorsements. Two of those, he doesn't. He doesn't get who he wants. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, yeah, Marcus O'Brien Fair and Grant Gonzalez. But I don't think he endorsed anybody in Etobicoke. I don't uh, believe. No, no, he didn't endorse anybody in that. Uh, Crisanti right. would likely be an ally for Tory, but he he wasn't endorsed by John Tory. But and I, and I think if s some of them that we didn't see that are very close, uh, Francis Nunziata's race, which is, as far as I know, too close to call right now. It's neck and neck. Uh, uh, you know, Amber Morley and Mark Rimes. Uh, so these are a lot of people who were close allies of John Tory's that he chose to personally endorse that are either, you know, hanging on by their fingernails or have been defeated. And I, and I think um, that does take maybe some of the, uh, the, the fire out of uh, Tory's celebration of his third victory. L looking at this, I think there's, there's going to be a lot of new faces on this city council. Uh, a lot of them are going to be self-identified as progressive uh, people rather than on the conservative side of the progressive conservative spectrum. Can we just address the term for one second? <laughs> we keep throwing around this term progressive and I think mm. it means something different. I mean progressive conservative on, a, on the provincial level and I think it means something different depending on who's talking. What, what does it mean when you hear progressive? I'm seeing uh, Progress Toronto which um, is run by a group of young people, dynamic, uh, tends to monitor what's happening in City Hall and often bring in petitions and bring people in City Hall and, and all of that. <laughs> they are sort of, I don't know how... Would I'm you say left? Left. Mm. Uh, left, 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 progressive left. Um, left, 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 or...? Here's, here's my, here's, here's my, <laughs> here's my <laughs> take on it is that uh, conservatives typically don't mind being described as conservative. Uh, but conservatives tend to use whatever word people use to describe themselves that's left-wing becomes a, a curse word. So like socialist or liberal or pinko, <laughs> whatever. Uh, and so progressive is now the term that people on the left side of the political spectrum, from, from the center to the left of the Liberal Party, as well as the New Democratic Party in Canada, uh, almost every Democrat in the United States describes themselves as progressive, right? The progressive conservatives like to say, you know, we like gay people, but we also like low taxes. Like, I think that's what progressive conservative kind of means in their minds, <laughs> is that they're socially liberal uh, and economically conservative. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good... Ed and Olivia, hold that thought. We just want to bring in some uh, results from the city of Ottawa here, another oh. closely watched race. Mark Sutcliffe has been elected the wow. new mayor 
in the city of Ottawa. Now, this was an open race. It was seen as, you know, the, the closest race in, in years because Jim Watson, Ottawa's longest serving mayor, uh, was not seeking re-election after 15 years on the job, 12 in a row. So uh, here we have Mark Sutcliffe with 51% of the vote. Now, just 32% of the polls reporting, but we do know that he has been elected mayor. Catherine McKenney, uh, at 38 percent. Yeah, Let's Olivia see. Olivia Child just said, yeah. wow, we'll get back to her in a second. But first, <laughs> first, we go to Colin. Uh, what, what's the wow factor here as you look at Ottawa? Well, the most interesting thing recently at a debate, all three of the leading mayoral candidates were asked, hey, you know, you've got these strong mayor powers that are being given to the next mayor of the city of Ottawa. Are you going to use them? And all of them said no. They thought that it was undemocratic. One after the other said no, 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 no. They're not going to uh, use these powers. And that really raised the ire of uh, Premier Doug Ford, who's extending these powers to the mayor of Ottawa, uh, you know, he said, as an example, when talking about uh, the construction of housing, he said, you know, you can't have um, either city councillors or municipal candidates uh, talking about not in my backyard, but also at the same time, we also need to build more affordable housing. So the big question is going to be what happens if they say no, if there is a veto power on the table and that veto power is to be used with provincial priorities and those provincial priorities are set by the premier, what happens if they choose to not use it, if they choose to not let the province kind of railroad the, uh, the municipal process? Can the province then step in and actually do something to see its will, uh, you know, come to fruition, come to reality? So that could be a major challenge for Mr. Sutcliffe um, as he embarks on his very first term as mayor. And I don't really think it's been determined at the provincial level really what the red line is going to be and you know, what will happen once one of those mayoral uh, candidates or those now mayors uh, says no to those provincial powers being extended to them by Doug Ford. So that, I think, okay, will be Colin, I just want to jump in right here because uh, John Tory is at the podium. We want to take you right there now to the Fairmont Royal York. That's true, but what I learned about him too. But I want to tell you, I just gave him a hug there, and I felt that beard against mine, and I thought I should. I thought maybe I should bring back my ponytail from the pandemic. <laughs> I was watching uh, TV upstairs, and uh, they were saying that what is what do candidates doing when they're uh, watching the results? And they said they think they're freaking out. I want it on the record clearly that I was not freaking out while I was watching the results. I denied that, but I was pacing around. But I'm glad. <laughs> to be here and I want to say tonight thank you everyone who's here and thank you Toronto. I am deeply grateful for the faith and the trust that you've chosen to put in me uh, once again to lead our city for four more years. I've delivered a number of these speeches on election nights and you know some of them were good and some of them to be candid weren't so good but tonight is a great night as we look ahead to a third term, a third term at City Hall with a strong mandate from the people of the City of Toronto. I want to begin by saying thank you to all the people, all of the people, because there were lots of them who put their names on ballots in this election. It's a courageous thing to do. And I want to, of course, congratulate those who've won seats on City Council. I look, I look forward to working with all of them. And I'm hugely hopeful about the future of this city. But there are challenges in front of us, and we have to meet those challenges together. And I'm looking forward. I, I've said many times during the campaign, I want to work with anybody who wants to work with me. And I look forward to working with all of the elected members of City Council as we work together to make a great city better. I want to, yeah. I want to thank my family. I want to thank the campaign team. I want to thank the volunteers and everyone who supported me throughout the campaign and over the last eight years as mayor. Well, we have a lot to celebrate tonight as a team and as a city. I requested that tonight should be lower key in keeping with these challenging times and should be about you, the people who made this happen for the city and for me uh, in this great democratic exercise we've just been through. And so I begin with a big and sincere thank you to my co-chairs, Anna Bailao, our deputy mayor who's retiring from politics for now, uh, Deb Hutton and Zubair Patel, who have also been co-chairs of the campaign, and of course, Patrick Harris, who did a superb uh, professional uh, job as uh, campaign manager and the entire campaign team, many of whom are here in this room. All of you, I give you my most sincere thanks. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your professionalism, for your amazing hard work, and above all, for your friendship. Because together, what we did is not that usual in this day and age. We ran a positive, responsible, honest campaign, 
one that goes against the prevailing negative divisive trend, and I am very thankful for that because that's the kind of campaign that I wanted to run, talking about we're, what we're going to do and some of our ideas uh, and doing it in a positive way, positive about the ideas and positive about the future of this city. Serving, serving as your mayor in this great city continues to be the honor of a lifetime. I love our city and I love working for the people of this city. That's why I ran for re-election in the first place. We've come so far over the past eight years, but we have unfinished business that I'm absolutely determined to see through. We've made so much progress on getting transit and housing built and growing our economy. And now we have a strong mandate to continue with that progress. And that is what I asked for, a strong mandate, and that is what I have been given. We're going to work with the provincial and federal governments to keep getting the big things done. We're going to get housing built, much more housing and much more affordable and supportive housing in many more places across our city. We're going to get the $28 billion transit plan built, the Scarborough subway, the Ontario line, the Eglinton Crosstown West, the Young Street North extension, and I am determined to make sure that the Eglinton East Scarborough LRT and the waterfront transit lines will be moving forward as well during this term of office. We are going to do everything we can to keep our city affordable for the residents who live here and for those who want to live here. We're going to do everything we can to keep our city safe and to support the police as they continue to modernize and keep us safe. We're going to do all we can to support all of the community organizations who work to help the people who need the help the most, including those experiencing homelessness. We're going to make sure that City Hall is focused on the nuts and bolts services that you and all the people of Toronto rely on every single day. I indicated during the campaign, I am not satisfied that some of those basics are as they should be and that we must and we will get to work on that tomorrow morning to make those things better and to make them as they should be and as they must be. We're going to do everything we can as a city government to make sure that Toronto's economy comes back stronger than ever. That's something I worked hard on uh, prior to the time of the pandemic. I worked hard on it during the pandemic and now I'm going to work hard to make sure we fashion the kind of recovery that leaves no one behind. And we're going to make sure, in that regard, that we keep our city united. I am very focused, as a person and as a mayor, on making sure that we do not fall victim to the strife and the divisiveness that we see elsewhere, and that we continue to be a city that welcomes and respects and supports everyone. There is no room in this city for the kind of hate or bitterness and division that some prefer for their own purposes. And so... And so... I will lead in a positive way. I will continue to lead in a positive way which unites to set an example by respecting everyone and by standing up and speaking up when any group of Torontonians are disrespected. We have resisted the global tide of division over these past years. I'm proud of that because it is true that diversity is our strength, but even greater inclusion must be our goal going forward. You know, I knocked on literally thousands of doors right across the city these past few months. There were no media cameras there, just me talking with Torontonians. And notwithstanding what you sometimes read, most of those people were filled with pride and hope for their city. But many of them are tired. They're still recovering from the dark days of the pandemic. They're feeling the pressures of the affordability crisis. They did feel that their mayor and their city government supported them through those days, and now they are looking for continued support from their city government. Support for communities which remain distant from the opportunity that is Toronto. Toronto is opportunity. It's opportunity all over the place, but people feel distant from that opportunity sometimes. Support for seniors who think that we're not moving fast enough to accommodate some of their changing needs. Support for those experiencing mental health and substance use challenges. They seem too often to just fall between the cracks. It's better these days in that we see them, but now we have to collectively decide and it's certainly a decision that I have made as the mayor now and the mayor who will be mayor for another four years that we are going to support them. And we can't do that alone. But we must support these people who are suffering in our city. They're suffering from an illness that happens to affect their brain. Would we leave people unsupported who are having a heart ailment or a lung ailment or a problem with their stomach? We wouldn't. And we must not continue to leave unsupported those who are experiencing mental illness and substance abuse. And we can't do it alone. It is a responsibility of the health care system, and that is a responsibility in which we will have to have a partnership to support people, a partnership with the other two governments. I want the thousands of people that I met and others I didn't meet 
to know that I will be working as hard as ever for the next four years to address those concerns that I just mentioned and others, to try to improve those supports that I mentioned, because those are the kinds of things that stand between us and our full potential as a city. We all know there are these challenges and, and others ahead. I made no secret of that when speaking on the campaign trail. Whether it be the city government or your own household, we will have to face economic and financial challenges in the coming months. The city itself is looking at more than a $1 billion budget crunch for next year. And since I will not be imposing big tax increases on people already in the midst of an affordability crisis, it's just not the right thing to do. It does mean that the challenge is in front of all of us, and that's every single person of every stripe from every point in the spectrum, every member of city council, which is to work together to find better ways to do things. And it means working just as hard to make sure that we have continued real partnerships with the other governments. Partnerships in which they recognize that we, the local government, are often best suited to support people locally, but we are not equipped to go it alone. And that is what I was talking about when I made reference to people suffering from mental health issues and substance issues. With my experienced leadership and with committed council colleagues, and I'm sure they will be committed, I'm confident we can get through this period of uncertainty and come out stronger on the other side because that's what people expect us to do. These challenges do not for one minute dampen my optimism about what lies ahead for this great city. In fact, I have never been more optimistic about this city's future and you should be optimistic too. Four years from now, I want you to be able to look back on this election and to know that you have made the right choice voting for me. I even want some of those who didn't vote for me to feel that the right collective choice was made on this day. So how will we measure that in 2026? Well, transit will have remained on track. More transit lines will be open with more on the way. More housing will be getting built and it will be lived in. Some of it will be lived in because it'll be built between now and then, hopefully as quickly as possible. It'll be happening faster than ever before. More homes will have been open to families and more will be on the way. And the supply of affordable and supportive housing will have been significantly increased. Our economy will be booming. Businesses will be thriving. More will be investing here and more jobs will have been created. Toronto will have remained a destination of choice for the individuals and the companies and the entrepreneurs from all around the world, bringing their skills and their energy and their investments to help us to grow. The city will be focused on serving residents, providing the best level of service so that people are confident they're getting the services they deserve and the services that represent the best value for their tax dollars. Our roads will be safer for everyone. We will have a safe city. We will have very significant initiatives underway in the arts. I've talked about those in the campaign. New parks and open spaces, I've also talked about. And we will be on track with our properly ambitious environmental goals. Those who've been marginalized will be able to feel a real sense of progress and hope on jobs and on transit and on housing. We will have continued to come together as a city. While so many other places have division and strife, Toronto will have continued to be a beacon to the world of a big, diverse city where everyone feels welcome, everyone feels safe and secure and respected. Those are the kinds of things I want people to be able to look back on when we get to 2026 at the end of this term in office. And we will, we will continue at that time to be recognized and admired for actually creating and maintaining a more inclusive and respectful city. That is what I will be proud to call a successful next four years and what I will work hard to deliver for you as your mayor. I'm ready to get back to work with the council, with the other governments, with the people to get things done. I'll be in the office first thing tomorrow morning working for you. And that's because, you know, it's for this simple reason. I love this city. I love this city. I love this job and the responsibility that goes with it, the privilege that goes with it. And I know that you love this city too. I know that our best days, our best days and the best days of this city lie ahead of us. And with the strong mandate that we've received from the people of Toronto tonight, I look forward to making real progress for you, for your families and for all of those who come to our great city in the years ahead to build their lives here. And so again, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I thank you, the team here, but I thank the people out there across the city for the strong mandate they've given me tonight. I can't tell you how grateful I am for the mandate and for the help. I thank you again. I hope you have a fantastic night. Let's celebrate. Thank you very much.
All right, loud cheering and music, a celebratory tone at John Tory's party headquarters tonight at the Fairmont Royal York. Uh, John Tory there in his speech thanking all of the people of Toronto, all of those who had voted for him. And he spoke about the changes that he would be making and issues that he would be tackling over his next uh, four years in his third term as the mayor of Toronto. And John Tory is going to be live on Global News Morning at 7.30 a.m. tomorrow for a one-on-one -on -one interview. And now it won't be all celebration for John Tory. Obviously, he won re-election, but those that he was endorsing at Toronto mm -hmm. City Hall, they all did not win. For example, in Etobicoke Lakeshore, this is a rematch from 2018. This time around, though, it's Amber Morley who wins over Mark Grimes. Grimes was endorsed by Tory. Grimes first elected in uh, 03, but Morley in her second attempt has unseated Mark Grimes in Etobicoke Lakeshore. Right, we are seeing a lot of results, of course, coming in quickly tonight, but uh, one area we are not seeing results coming out of is Hamilton right now where our Sean O'Shea is live. Uh, Sean, what is the holdup there? Well, we're inside the uh, the Spice Factory, which is quite the event venue, and they're passing all around all kinds of food and trying to keep everybody, um, well, everybody's waiting and has no choice. And they're honestly, the campaign team, everybody's expecting the results to drop any minute because there was a technical glitch here, couldn't get the results back uh, as quickly as in other parts of the province. Uh, so right now, they're on a holding pattern. Uh, Andrea Horvath is upstairs in this facility. Uh, she's watching, uh, watching to see what will happen, what the results are. Uh, once uh, the results drop, which we expect to happen very shortly, uh, she will come down, she will make a speech at the podium behind. Her campaign team suggests she will probably, probably talk to reporters uh, after that fact, depending on uh, how how things turn out. Uh, there's been a lot of optimism though in Hamilton uh, when it comes to Andrea Horvath's campaign. As I said on the earlier part of the broadcast, you know, she's won nine out of ten times that she's run for office, federally, provincially, municipally. Uh, this is her first run for mayor, and of course, this is the biggest municipal run uh, for her. Uh, two main content contenders, um, but Andrea Horvath is the name, the face, the person who's got the most name recognition uh, here in Hamilton, uh, generally well-liked. Boy, we spent some time with her on the street today. You don't have to wait very long before somebody comes up and puts their arm around Andrea Horvath or gives her a hug or says, you know, we're cheering for you. Today's also, as I mentioned earlier, her 60th birthday. So they're hoping that what happens tonight in the next couple of minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, that it's going to be uh, celebratory and that it will be the first female mayor of the city of Hamilton. Never been a female mayor in the city. It's always been men. That could change with Andrea Horvath tonight. She's had strong personal campaigns uh, when she ran for provincial office for city council. And so she's no stranger here. The question is, uh, will she have enough to be able to turn this into a victory tonight. We're standing by and we'll have that when it happens. Back to you. Okay, Sean O'Shea and her birthday, no less. Uh, so from one party hoping to be a celebration to another that certainly is in Mississauga for Bonnie Crombie. There she is with some Ooh. dance moves going on there. <laughs> winning her third term as the mayor of Mississauga. She's going to be making her victory speech any moment now. So let's, uh, let's listen in. Wow. Thank you, Mississauga. <laughs> Happy Diwali and Bendy Chordivas to all of those celebrating Shoot Diwali, Diwali Dion Luk Luk Madanya. Wow. What a night. Um, it has been an incredible privilege to serve the people of Mississauga for the past eight years. And I look forward to continuing to provide the same strong, steady leadership that you've come to deserve and expect from your leaders. Tonight's victory is our victory. It's because we share a common vision for the future we want to see for Mississauga. This is just the start of what we are going to achieve over the next term by working together. I want, I want every single person in this room and voters across this great city, thank you. I want to say to you, thank you for your support. It's been truly humbling. John, thank you for that kind introduction. 
and of course for your support and your friendship over many years. I want to congratulate all my colleagues on their successful re-election and thank all of those with the courage to put their names on the ballot from school trustee to counselor and of course to mayor. And I'd like to welcome some new counselors to the team in Ward 2, Alvin Tejo. In Ward 6, Joe Hornick. In Ward 11, Brad Butt. And a couple other racists that are too close to call at this moment, but I look forward to welcoming them to the team very, very soon. So let's give them a big round of applause. We are going to work together to move Mississauga forward and ensure that it is a great place to live. As many of you, of you know, running a campaign requires a lot of effort, a lot of hard work from a lot of people. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank my entire campaign team led, uh, led by Darren MacArthur. Many of them are here with us tonight. Let's hear it for them. Honestly, they are the people who put in all the long hours, all the long nights. And to all our volunteers who gave up their evenings, their weekends, and their time away from their family and friends to put up thousands of lawn signs and knock on countless doors. I'm not going to name names, but I sincerely want to thank you all, everyone who has continued to stand with me. And while I may be the one up here tonight, I wouldn't, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be without the efforts of countless people, particularly my three children, Alex, Jonathan, Natasha, my partner, all who support me unconditionally and understand that I've made a commitment to public service, which often means significant time away from them. And on that note, I stand here tonight with a promise. As your mayor, I will continue to stand up for our city and what's best for our city. Unite, not divide people. Fight for fairness while advancing our efforts to build a world-class city that is the envy of the world. Know, know that you can count on me to get the job done. I ran on a campaign of strong, steady leadership. And for the past 11 years, I have never stopped working for Mississaugans. And I will get up tomorrow morning and continue working for you. In less than, in less than two years, Mississauga will turn 50. We are no longer a young suburban city. We are emerging as an innovative, sustainable city of the future. As the province's third largest city, Mississauga stands tall. We stand proud and we stand ready to take on the future. Yes. We are a city capable of making its own decisions and standing on our own two feet. An independent city. Yet one that remains affordable for middle-class families, a place where your children and your grandchildren will be able and, of course, will want to, to live, to work, and raise a family for generations to come. And we will do this by continuing to tackle the housing affordability crisis and making progress on our plans to build more middle-income housing and provide more housing options. You have my word that I will do what is in my power and pocketbook to make life easier for Mississaugans amidst sky-high inflation rates by being your voice and pressing for change at the provincial and the federal levels of government, advocating for measures that make a difference, from rent relief to a freeze on staple food items and, and working to ensure that $10 a day childcare makes its way into the hands of families. And if the last two years have taught us anything, 
we are resilient. There's nothing Mississauga can't conquer or achieve together. Your mayor and council are not only working to meet the challenges of today, but of tomorrow by building a strong, sustainable city of the future. Because by 2050, Mississauga will be home to over one million people. And all of these people will not only need a place to live, but be able to get to and, and from work and school each day quickly and efficiently, which is why we will work to build more transit and integrate it into all our new major housing developments to reduce congestion and help Mississauga shed the car culture that has defined us in decades past. As our city grows and we work to build complete communities, we will ensure our neighborhoods remain safe and welcoming places to raise a family. Over the next four years, I look forward to working closely with my fellow councillors and to make sure your neighborhoods, the places you are proud to call home, have access to all the things that make our city so great. Parks, trails, playgrounds, splash pads, bike lanes, and much, much more. And that they remain safe places. Safe places for children to grow and to play. And by addressing excessive speeding and improving road safety and working to reduce car thefts and gun and gang violence. We will also remain an economic engine, a hub for business and highly skilled jobs, a place where people want to invest, to work and to study, a place where tourists want to visit, with hubs for art, culture, innovation and entertainment, especially in our downtown and of course along our waterfront places where people come together and where Mississauga truly comes alive. There's a lot to look forward to and a lot of work to do in the next four years. So I ask all Mississaugans to keep that momentum going. Stay united and let's work together to make this vision a reality and ensure as our city changes that it remains a place where everyone sees themselves, where everyone belongs, and where everyone can grow and thrive. And as I said from the beginning of this campaign, I will continue to provide the strong and steady leadership that you have come to expect at City Hall. Leadership that gets the job done. Leadership that delivers the real results. Leadership that drives our city forward. Working together, we can accomplish anything. You can count on me. This is our city, and this is our future, Mississauga. Thank you. Can I have my kids up here? <laughs> that is uh, Bonnie Crombie inviting her kids up to the stage after her victory speech, where she has now won a third consecutive term as mayor of the city of Mississauga. Let's quickly check some results that we have coming in from Toronto City Council. These are two very, very interesting wards. Parkdale High Park, Gord Perks, a longtime councillor, been a thorn in the side of John Tory. John Tory repeatedly was in this ward campaigning for Syria Agrel, who came third here. So John Tory doesn't get who he wants there. Then Francis Nunziata, this is too close to call. This Nunziata, Francis Nunziata, obviously a long-term councillor, and was also endorsed by Tory. And yeah, before we chew through these boards with our panelists here, we do want to point out that uh, newly elected uh, mayor, Patrick Brown, is now on the stage in Brampton. So he's about to make his speech. We are going to listen in there. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, what, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, what a big victory tonight. Thank you, Brampton. And of course, uh, happy Diwali and Bondichor Divis to all those uh, celebrating this evening in our city. Now, Genevieve, 
very special night uh, for us uh, to see such beautiful support across the city. Um, and I have to say, you know, this is a win against uh, the politics of negativity, of mudslinging. We, we, run, we ran a positive campaign. We refused to engage in the ugly side of politics and focused on what we've achieved for Brampton over the last four years and what we hope to achieve in the next four. And I'm proud to say we stood up for Brampton over the last four years. We fought for Brampton over the last four years. You know, when we weren't getting proper funding for health care, we declared a health care emergency and forced the conversation and convinced the government that Brampton does need a second hospital and construction is going to start in the next year. We've got a med school coming to Brampton too, first in 100 years in the GTA. Whether it's new recreation, the two new facilities, field hockey, cricket, any cricket fans here tonight? Okay. Uh, a healthy city is one that's active and, and that's what we're determined to build. You know, I look at the expansion in, in transit uh, that we're proud to have fought for, expansions in GO Train. We actually had a press conference on a moving GO Train four years ago when, when they curtailed GO Train service and we got it back and now it's even being expanded. You know, Brampton is a beautiful city. It's such an honor to fight for this city. And I'm proud to say that we are the only big city in the country that froze property taxes and at the same time brought in free transit for seniors. I see some of our first responders here tonight in the crowd, to the firefighters, to the paramedics, to the police who stood by us. I just want to say thank you. You know, incredible. You know, individuals who run towards danger when everyone else runs away, there's a debt of gratitude we have for our first responders. And one thing I wanted to say tonight is a lot of people sometimes will point the finger at Brampton. And I think there is talent, resiliency, and greatness in our city that we should be proud of. I want us to hold our head high. You know, during the pandemic, you had people pointing to Brampton saying we had higher positivity rates. We had higher positivity rates during COVID-19 because we have the most essential workers of any big city in this country, and it was our truck drivers, our logistics sector, our food processing plants that kept Canada's supply chain together. And if anything, we should be saying thank you, Brampton. Thank you, Brampton. You know, I had the... Thank you, Shafi. I had, I had the New York Times call my office um, a few weeks ago. Maybe it was actually two months ago now. And they said, what's in the water in Brampton? And I said, well, it's clean, good water. And they said, no, why does one city have half the soccer players going to the, national, the World Cup in Qatar? There is talent. There is talent in our city that we should be proud of. And it's not just soccer. The Tyler Seguins who won the Stanley Cup, the Sean Monahans, the cricket stars, the field hockey stars. There is an extraordinary talent in our city that we should be proud of. The Alessa Caras, the Rupi Kors. I'm proud to be a Bramptonian. And I want all of you to be proud to be Bramptonians. All right, there is uh, Mayor Patrick Brown in for a second term in that city. Let's bring in our Colin DeMello to talk a little bit about his speech. And, you know, Colin, this is a, a man who has dipped his toe and sometimes jumped all, all the way in uh, at all levels of government. He is someone, though, who controversy and scandal has followed uh, at, at every level, um, <laughs> really. And, and so voters, though, are, are saying that they want Patrick Brown back in the mayor's seat in Brampton. What is the appeal there? Well, and he's winning by a huge majority here. Uh, you, you know, Patrick Brown, as he did provincially, was really able to tap into a lot of those, um, you know, multicultural segments of the uh, of the voting population. Uh, and, and so, you know, the cloud of controversy will continue. There will be more of this to come because, uh, you know, some are saying that he shouldn't even get the strong mayor powers that was the appeal that
that they were making to the province during this election campaign. So we'll see what happens in the next few weeks and months ahead. Colin, we do just want to jump in there because our Brittany Rosen live at uh, Mississauga headquarters for, for Bonnie Crombie is standing by live with Bonnie Crombie right now. Uh, Brittany, over to you. Hi, Tracy. Yes, that is right. Bonnie Crombie has just won her third consecutive term as Mississauga's mayor. You know, I spoke to you earlier today. You were feeling really nervous, but after the results have come in and you have won this victory, how are you feeling? A little relieved. I'm always a little bit anxious on election day, and I've got a new team coming in. It looks like I'll have at least, well, I'll have uh, four new councillors, actually. Um, so I'm pretty happy about that. It will add more diversity to our council, so I'm very proud of that. And I've got a strong mandate from the people to continue to build on our priorities, as we have outlined, uh, continuing to invest in our infrastructure, to bring more affordability and affordable housing to our city, uh, to continue to build public transit at the time, same time that we build new subdivisions and continuing to attract investments. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of what we've accomplished in Mississauga, and I, I'm, I'm honored that the people have um, are allowing me this opportunity to continue to provide them with leadership going forward. You talked about the importance of the independence of Mississauga, and Megxit has been a big priority of yours, separating Mississauga from Peel. How is that going to play into your next term? I'll certainly be speaking with the Premier and the provincial government about the need to provide more fairness and value to Mississauga taxpayers. We really, truly feel that our tax dollars should stay in our city and not be allocated to another re to a regional government where there's a lot of duplication, a lot of red tape. If we could eliminate the duplication and red tape, we could save a billion dollars over 10 years. We could speed up the uh, development process and we could get more affordable housing built more quickly. It's time for us to control our own destiny and not have to go and receive permission from another level of council from other municipalities uh, to move forward our own priorities. You know, we supply 60% of the funding for the region appeal and we only have 50% of the vote. There are lots of cost sharing arrangements we can en enter into to continue to build infrastructure, but it's an obsolete concept for the region appeal. All three municipalities are at different stages in their growth and development. And uh, Mrs. So it's very important to Mississauga that our taxpayers receive the fairness and the value that they deserve. And we have the opportunity to stand on our own two feet and be an independent city. You won in 2014 by 63% of the votes. In 2018, 76%. Again, we're seeing a large margin that you won by in this election. What do you want to say to the people that went out there and voted for you? I want to say thank you for having confidence in me and confidence in my leadership and confidence in the vision that your council has provided. I'm truly honored for this opportunity uh, to lead once again for the next four years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Crommy. Congratulations. I'll send it back to you in studio. Okay, Brittany, thank you so much for that. Let's take you through some results that are, well, a little too close to call at this point. Here's the city of Vaughan and the race for mayor there. 62% of the polls reporting, and take a look at that. Stephen Del Duca leading ever so slightly with 38% of the vote. Sandra Young Racco right there, just behind him at 37%. And if you take a look at the vote numbers there, Del Duca has a lead of just over 200 votes. So uh, votes definitely still, or, or they're still being counted at this time. In Hamilton, we've had a delay late tonight, which means that the votes have been pretty slow coming in. As you can see, only 13% of polls reporting at this point. But look at this. It is very close in the early going with okay. Andrea Horvath uh, in a tie with Keenan Loomis. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that. And uh, let's go to Sean O'Shea, who is at Andrea Horvath's headquarters. Uh, this is not the sort of jump out to an early lead and cruise to victory that the Horvath camp was hoping for, Sean. No, it is absolutely not, Alan. I mean, I'm looking at numbers. They keep switch, switching, but she was ahead by 31 votes. This is on 17,000 to 17,000. She's up by a little over 100 votes. It is really razor thin. It could go either way. And remarkably, so close. I mean, depends on where you are in the Hamilton area and how many signs. Like, Loomis, the competitor here, lots of signs up on the mountain. Downtown, uh, not so much. But just such an absolutely close race. Uh, polls showed, opinion polls showed that Andrea Horvath was out to 
win this one, but she told me in an interview today they were taking nothing for granted. They were volunteering. They were getting people out to vote today. And you can see why with those kinds of numbers. No final numbers in yet. You said it yourself a minute ago. This was all delayed. This was well over an hour after the rest of the province started bringing in numbers. But, hey, they're celebrating because it's Andrew Horvath's birthday, as I said a couple of times earlier. They just don't know whether she's going to become the first mayor of Hamilton. That is just so close. She has been ahead all night. I will say that. As little as 31 votes and the numbers are changing, but it is very, very close. She's upstairs watching the results come in, and there cannot be a lot of confidence right now that she's going to pull this one out. Still have to watch those numbers come in. Back to you guys. Okay, thank you so much for that, Sean. Uh, Olivia, are you surprised by these close races? No, I don't think so, because if you're not incumbent, you don't have, well, even though party leaders have uh, name recognition, but Rocco Young have been in there for, I don't know, 20 years, a long, long time. So she served her community um, in Vaughan. Mm -hmm. uh, for for longest time, so she has a pretty good name recognition. Also, is it is it the same as in you know provincial and federal politics, where it's your organization to get out the vote? I mean, is is it that it's the ground game at the end of the day? Uh, partially, but it is also what is your air? What's your message? Is it status quo or you want change? If you want change, why? How can you deliver it? Who is the so-called enemy, right? If you are incumbent and if people want change, you're in trouble. If you, well, except unless you're John Tory. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but if you're incumbent and people really want change, if you can point to someone else who say, it's their problem. I'm working with you to conquer that problem. Let's do it together. Mm -hmm. That would work. Yeah. But for newcomers, it's a bit harder mm -hmm. um, to, to come in and say that you want change, but they believe you that you have the means to make that change. And you talk about name recognition uh, and that playing a factor in Vaughan, obviously, but I, I would say that the more surprising one uh, is in, in Hamilton, and I don't know if you agree with that, with Keenan mm -hmm. Loomis being so close to Andrea Horvath. And, she may have not served on in municipal politics for a while now, but she certainly has that recognition there, and she was there uh, in the city ranks for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly to those of us who aren't in and around Hamilton, it's a surprise, because we know Andrea Horvath. We assume she's well-liked. I think, I think he, even her opponents at Queen's Park respected her and thought mm -hmm. she was a, uh, a politician with a lot to offer. And so... So for those of us who aren't there, but I, I think this is a, a big thing where coming back around to you, we're asking about the ground game, but it's almost like ground sentiment, like mm -hmm. what uh, people have been working in that community. And, and sometimes a community feels like, like this may not be a celebrity, but this is our boy, right? Or this is our girl. Mm -hmm. and, and if they can use that to get people out supporting them, then, then even someone who brings in arguably a bigger political machine and a bigger name recognition, uh, well, what we're seeing is that <laughs> they're putting up a big fight in, in Vaughn as well, right? Uh, so, so across the board, people that, the re those of us in the rest of Ontario say, oh, I recognize that name, they're probably going to win for sure. Okay. Eh, maybe not so much. Mm -hmm. Take you back to uh, Brampton. Uh, this is uh, Patrick Brown uh, speaking to some reporters after his victory, where he has won re-election as mayor of Brampton. Of course, it's well known the, the existing college opposed the university also, concept, but I believe young people in Brampton deserve the same opportunities as a young person in Waterloo, Sudbury, Kingston, Guelph, just to name a few much smaller cities that have a university. So I'm going to continue to be ambitious, fighting for more for Brampton. I think for far too long our city was shy and polite and we didn't stick up for ourselves. You've been clear that you wanted to run a, a clean campaign without the mudslinging uh, and it, it worked. Why do you think that resonated? So often in so many campaigns, the mudslinging tends to work, not in this case. Well, I think it shows um, in the hearts of hearts of our residents that there's more love and decency um, in residents than there's those um, that, that admire that type of U.S.-style negativity. And boy, did we see a lot of it um, this campaign. And so um, I think it speaks to the maturity of our city that we reject that type of toxic politics. Mayor, just in from the Nikki Poor campaign, they've sent a notice to, to media saying, as of 9.20, a scrutineer at Brampton City Hall reporting multiple machines were wrapped and broken, but 
numerous technical issues that were ongoing, including broken machines and locked machines. Uh, the scrutiny are describing a lot of problems. What do you say to that? Um, I think that I think the campaign just got blown out of the water, and they're they're probably looking for some talking points. Um, you know, our city clerk is a man of um, integrity, and uh, um, I'm sure he um, ran a, a very fair uh, uh, election. Um, and so, uh, you know, I would just say for those that misled on polls, those that tried attack ads, I think now is the time to um, acknowledge it didn't work rather than make excuses. Um, you know, we had people paid political um, operatives who were not from Brampton, they came in from far away um, to run a negative campaign and they got soundly rejected. And so I guess they're a little bit embarrassed right now because they put out polls that were false. Um, they made uh, allegations that were clearly wrong. And you know, I'll go back to this um, and I've said this before. You know, the reason I fired Nick Cavallis in 2016 when I was the PC leader was he retweeted a comment, Islam is poison. And I know he's here on a vendetta, um, but I don't regret uh, dismissing him in 2016. I'll never have space, never give oxygen to hate, intolerance, um, and, and that type of ugliness. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. All right, and that uh, was Patrick Brown, who has just won uh, as a second term as mayor of Brampton. Colin DeMello, let's continue talking about Patrick Brown. And we did just hear him answer some questions from reporters there. He spoke about a clean campaign and the mudslinging yeah. that happens. And, you know, it's no secret. There's been controversy and scandal following him around right up until the final days of this campaign for him, including allegations of mismanagement of funds. And yet here he is winning a very strong mandate to become a mayor of Brampton again. Yeah, and I just wanted to give you a bit of context for what he was saying at the very end there. Um, you know, just a few moments ago, we all got an email from the Nikki Core campaign, his uh, primary opponent, just saying that as of 9.20 p.m., they say they claim that a scrutineer at Brampton City Hall was reporting multiple machines, voting machines were either locked or broken with numerous technical issues. So one of the reporters had asked Patrick Brown about that, and Patrick Brown said that, you know, instead of acknowledging the loss, he claims that, uh, you know, her supporters are continuing to spread, in his words, false information. You know, this has been a very nasty campaign because one of the central people who's been working on Nikki Kors' campaign is a person by the name of Nick Cavallis. And Nick Cavallis might not be known in public circles, but certainly in private political circles, uh, he is a well-known name. He has helped uh, John Tory on multiple election campaigns. Uh, Nick Cavallis, a pollster, has helped Doug Ford in uh, two successive election campaigns most recently recently helping him win another strong majority government. And this time he had switched sides, working against Patrick Brown uh, with the Nikki Core campaign to bring him down. Uh, they kept raising scandal after scandal after scandal. But regardless of that, it seems like Patrick Brown was able to overcome all of that. His mayoral, uh, mayoralty, though, his next uh, mandate is still going to be you know, colored with a lot of controversy. And, and this is why. There were recent allegations that Patrick Brown's, uh, you know, federal run for conservative party leader that maybe some of the spending was happening during or charged to the city of Brampton and that would violate federal election laws. So he might have to be contending with a lot of scandal in his first couple of years in office. And in fact, there were some city councilors, former city councilors in Brampton that had news that he might not be able to finish out the term. So, I mean, this was one of the most interesting races. It was certainly one of the most lively races uh, in all of Ontario. But regardless of all of that, voters still backed Patrick Brown or the really strong majority, it just goes to show that for some people it might be name recognition, it might be those connections that he made on the ground with the community. But as you can see here, 60% of voters uh, with 86% of polls uh, reporting have backed Patrick Brown over Nikki Kaur, his challenger, and she only got 26%. Yeah, and that is a, a significant increase from 2018 when he won with 44% of the vote. So here we have Patrick Brown with 60% of the vote. Popularity for him seems to have risen. Now you talk about the strong support from voters for Patrick Brown, Colin, but does he have that same support within council? We know there's been a lot of infighting within Brampton City Council, and that Patrick Brown has seemed to widen those gaps even further. 
How is he going to work with this council? Yeah, that is going to be a very interesting look forward because for Patrick Brown, I mean, there have been successive city council meetings in Brampton that have been suspended as a result of, you know, Patrick Brown per perhaps focusing a lot of time and attention on the federal Conservative Party uh, leadership race, one that he was eventually disqualified from. So what happens in Brampton is going to be, you know, definitely one that's going to be written about in the next few uh, weeks and months. A another question, how we're really easy going to be working with Doug Ford, right? We saw initially the relationship was very frosty after 2018, but then you know, it really started to thaw out, particularly during the pandemic. The pandemic changed a lot of the political relationships in Ontario. Doug Ford working a lot with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, John Tory working a lot with Doug Ford, Trudeau, and, and same happened with Brampton and uh, the provincial government. But there are calls for Doug Ford to not extend those strong mayor powers to Brampton uh, because his mayoral rivals had claimed that, you know, there would be some abuse of that process. So what will Doug Ford do? There was some suggestion that, you know, the province might as soon as tomorrow start extending those strong mayor powers to other municipalities, to large municipalities, as the premier has promised. We'll see whether Brampton will be on that list because it could mean some very interesting conversations and an interesting dynamic between Doug Ford, Patrick Brown, Brampton and Ontario. OK, thank you so much for that, Colin. And we just want to take you through a couple of those close mayoral races uh, here. The city of Hamilton, Keenan Loomis with a slight lead over Andrea Horvath, her mayor of Hamilton right now. Just important to note there, though, that only 28% of the polls reporting here for this result. It's very early on. In Vaughan, Stephen Del Duca trying to win here, and he has a very, very narrow lead over Councillor Sandra Young Rocco. Uh, he's trying to uh, win after stepping down as leader of the Ontario Liberal Party earlier this year. Uh, let's get some final thoughts from our panelists. I know all of the results are not in, but let's start, Olivia, with you and what you see in City Council. What's this mean in terms of Toronto, do you think, in the direction going forward? Before I talk to about Toronto, I noticed that Patrick Brown in Brampton, mm. they're 64% of salvation. They have stuck to him. Uh, when he ran for the leader of um, the PC mm -hmm. and when he went on cons uh, running for the leader of conservative, they came out for him. It's the relationship that you built with the people, uh, your voters. And if the relationship is strong, whether you have strong name recognition or not, it looks like um, he came in. Back to the city uh, of Toronto. Uh, if you look at majority of the incumbent, they won by 70, 75 percent of the vote. With uh, um, Gord Perks was uh, tossed up in three, I think he's going to be okay, but it, it's close. Uh, Francis Nunciada, it's, uh, which is the um, deputy speaker, the speaker and deputy mayor, been there for a long time, established name, uh, struggling. Uh, she may pull through, but very, very close. There are four votes difference uh, with, what, 20? Oh, they, <laughs> mm -hmm. just one? She just no, no, it was declared? Still. It was still very close. Um, and Mark Grimes uh, went down, who was also uh, if you could sum up, If you could sum up what you, I mean, I know those are all not settled yet. Yeah. But what's that mean for Toronto going forward with John Tory leading for a third time? He will have... A small number of, as you said, progressive folks in there, newcomers that have a lot of energy, they have a different points of view. Mr. Tory have a chance to be bold, to be courageous, to, to do something. That would be his legacy. This is his last term. I think if he pays some attention to those progressive voices, because they are not very big in terms of number of councillors, then he can have a legacy that ensure no one is left behind, that truly good affordable housing get built, and a police force that protect folks and not, you know, some people in the community don't necessarily uh, want them, right? So how do you bridge that? So lots of things to do, uh, and uh, I hope Mr. Tory would 
seize that opportunity <laughs> and make it happen. All right, we want to get Ed's final thoughts too on the makeup of council and how John Tory's term may look a little different this time around. Yeah, I mean, I think John Tory has always been, he's famous, he positions himself as a guy who's in the middle of the road, right? Uh, bland works, it's the old Bill Davis strategy that he learned when he was principal, strat uh, principal strategist for him or advisor for him. Um, but, but he's, he's a guy, and I think he's shown this time and again, that he wants to be a consensus builder. And if a consensus emerges on the city council, he'll run up to the front of it, right? He'll, he'll lead that charge. And Joe Cressy in the last council, as a left-wing guy, was able to sort of get John Tory and pull him along. And when I look at um, a number of progressives, Alejandra Bravo, Asma Malik, but also um, uh, uh, Amber Morley, who beat Mark Grimes, uh, there's... there's it's going to be a slightly more left-leaning council maybe than it was. A lot of John Tory endorsed people have lost. And so maybe there's a, an, an opportunity there for those people to... John Tory has shown that he'll open doors for them. And if, if, if that's where the popular thing is to be had, then he'll, he'll come over to that side. So, you know, perhaps people who wanted m more legacy building from him, it, it'll be there. But we'll, we'll have to see how... How, how some of these close, close ones well, shake out. Yeah. Yep. Ed, Olivia, thank you so much for being part of this important coverage tonight. That is a wrap for this special edition of Global News Decision 2022. But much more coverage is ahead. We're going to have a complete recap of the election results and reaction on Global News at 11. And Toronto Mayor John Tory will be live tomorrow on Global News Morning at 7.30 a.m. And you can, of course, follow up-to-the-minute developments on our website, globalnews.ca. For all of us here, thank you so much for watching. See you soon.